Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, so welcome uh, everybody here in the room and, and welcome uh, uh, people online for uh, the third Veterinary Big Data Stakeholder Forum. As we, it's great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this uh, third edition of the Veterinary Big Data Stakeholder Forum. And I, I must go back a few years when we started developing uh, uh, a veterinary big data strategy uh, when we first started to, to talk about it and remember the first veterinary big data stakeholder forum now approximately two years ago, uh, which was a bit, a bit looking and a bit testing on what is the environment in the veterinary arena for uh, big data, big data approaches. Uh, and we, we then organized that with a lot of input from outside uh, the network. And I'm happy to see that now we have two years later, we've got a lot of input from inside the network and we can report on some of the developments we've, uh, we've activated. I, 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 I can't look back without mentioning uh, one person that has been very pivotal to the development of the veterinary big data uh, uh, strategy for a reason that she is no longer here. Uh, she's no longer part of our team, Ilaria Del Sepia, uh, whom uh, some of you may know um, and may remember, has moved on uh, to a different post outside this agency. Uh, but she has been both the initiator, the designer, the strategic thinker, and our uh, data scientist uh, uh, to support the veterinary big data strategy. And I would like to say that uh, uh, we would not be here now without her inputs uh, at the different uh, fora. Um, so after having said that, this is the, the third uh, stakeholder forum event that EMA has organized since the inception of the work on the veterinary big data in the European Medicines Agency Regulatory Network uh, in, uh, in 2021. I think these events have contributed to building awareness among our stakeholders on the potential use of innovative digital te technologies in the veterinary domain and share ambitions and opportunities, but also discuss the challenges on how we can all benefit from these new technologies in the context of animal health and medicines regulation. And we, we now see indeed that coming practically practical into play also in, in requests from industry to discuss with us potential applications of, uh, of data in a different way than we used to look at them in the, in the past. Building upon uh, last year's engaging discussions, uh, today we are here to continue to build a momentum and stimulate further discussion on how we can respond to a fast changing data driven environment and how these new technologies can support veterinary regulatory activities now and in the future. And, and it's, it's about big data, it's about artificial intelligence, it's about all those technological developments that we see in the world around us. And, and that bring new developments every year and uh, where I think we really struggle keeping up with that, uh, with those uh, d developments and to see how we can adapt them to the regulatory uh, framework, both on the veterinary as well as on the human side. And very thankful for Jesper that he joins us today also uh, to give his uh, experience on, the, on, on that side. So today's event is structured around three sessions. Um, the first session is focusing on providing updates on the latest developments and the work plans in the area of big data in the EU medicines regulatory domain, and in particular in the veterinary uh, domain. A second session, we will hear about a number of concrete initiatives as examples of the potential applications of digital technologies in different areas across the regulatory systems in Europe. And then finally, in session three, we, we host a panel of experts to provide further reflections and comments on the benefits, the barriers, and the recommendations on how we can integrate big data into regulatory decision making and to support the development of innovative medicines and optimize the safe and effective use of medicines. In the, in the past two years, this forum has raised a high level of interest and enthusiasm among our stakeholders. And this current edition will continue to do so, judging by the high number of colleagues connected, which includes representatives of pharmaceutical industry, animal healthcare professionals, academia, research institutions, regulatory authorities, and other national and international uh, government bodies. And I, I do hope that we, uh, next year, of course, we will have another meeting building upon uh, the experience uh, from today 
and uh, the actual implementation of big data in the coming year. We do hope that the discussion today will further guide the EU Veterinary Medicines Regulatory Network and its stakeholders on how to embrace the potential that digital technologies can bring and inspire us all to continue working towards a more data-driven regulatory system. And also that it will contribute to identifying opportunities that can be implemented in the short and medium term to support regulatory activities through better evidence for product development, but also or for the authorization and on market safety and effectiveness monitoring of medicines and other associated activities. So without further ado, it, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the first session, uh, Dr. Laure uh, Baudel, next to me, welcome. Um, before uh, Dr. Baudel was recruited at the end of 2015 at the French Agency for Veterinary Medicinal Products as the head of pharmaceutical assessment unit, she worked for 27 years in the veterinary pharmaceutical industry, where she first managed European clinical development projects and then headed clinical and preclinical development and regulatory affairs departments with several international veterinary pharmaceutical companies. She graduated as a veterinarian from the French National Veterinary School of Toulouse and also has qualifications in biostatistics for clinical research. Since 2020, uh, Dr. Laurie Baudel uh, has overseen cross-functional projects within the regulatory affairs and transversal projects mission at ANMV. And in 2021, uh, she also joined the EU Veterinary Big Data Hub. Dr. Baudel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello. So I have the pleasure to, to open this first, uh, se to introduce this first session. So uh, about um, the progress and uh, update on uh, that big data. And uh, I have the, um, the pleasure to um, introduce the first speaker, who will be Jesper Kerr. So um, he's a head of uh, data analytics at Danish Medicine Agency, and uh, he's uh, graduated in bio informatics and, and uh, computer science. And uh, Jesper brings long experience of uh, data handling and analysis of data and uh, in the academic uh, environment, but also in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, he has also developed uh, IT systems for the World Health Organization and uh, University Hospital of Copenhagen. So uh, Jesper has also led the development of a risk-based monitoring IT and uh, in, uh, notably in Europe uh, programs, European programs, and he's also co-chair of the Big Data Steering Group. So Jesper, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And, and also as, as a small remark, previous actually, I'm also, I studied veterinary medicine but when I came to anatomy, I just realized that the computer science and bioinformatics caught my attention more than the textbooks. I'm sorry, but <laughs> that's where it ended. So I'm, I'm really of the deepest admiration of your capabilities of remembering all of those fine details. So um, just humble to be here to present. Uh, if I can bring the slides up, please. So I'm here to uh, talk about the, see if we can advance this, on the elements in our big data uh, steering group activities, really the drivers for change, uh, the task force vision and our data, big data priority recommendations and the key achievements so far uh, that we have took status of here in 2023 and then a work plan going forward. And along the way, I'll highlight where the interactions are with the veterinary domain. So just have a focus on that as well. It's um, the drivers for change here to actually use big data and, and use that comes through both the big data task force recommendation that it's getting close to being four or five years old, but also the network strategy towards 2025, really articulating the use and the need of use of uh, big data analytics and also technologies like, like artificial intelligence. There's also a changing pol policy environment with European health data space and the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe. And moreover so, which is really the surrounding affecting us, the changing te technological environment the importance of AI, and I think we're all realizing that uh, over the past half year uh, with the workshop we had also with veterinary participation earlier this week, is really of increased significance. 
experimentation with AI and analytics is also something that many of the NCAs and we in the network together with EMA are really doing. Um, there's a problem with the slow speed of product development in general, the burden of unmet medical need. So all of these technologies, data really are there to enable both a better healthcare data access, study methods and advanced analytics in order to, to deal with some of these challenges. What we are aiming to do with a big data vision is really that to have a regulatory system that's able to integrate big data into assessment and decision making. So we can really support the development of innovative medicines to deliver life-saving treatments to patients more quickly and optimize the safe and effective use of these medicines. And it's really the knowing when and how to rely on novel technologies and the evidence generated from big data that will benefit public health, as was stated in the task force report back then. There's a lot of components coming together to actually do this, including, as you can see, also the veterinary recommendations, but with the separate veterinary big data strategy, obviously there's very, very good dedicated focus to that. I will highlight some of these interactions we have as we try to take the journey on regulatory acceptability of data analytics, data linkage, data standardization, data sharing and access, and data quality, all terms that resonate equally well, both in medicines as in veterinary uh, medicines uh, use uh, more specifically. Key achievement so far in the work we have done is really the establishment of Darwin EU being a network of data sources. So far, 10 data sources expanding with additional 10 and potentially, once we do that, get to beyond 108 million active patients across Europe. That's quite a big number. 19 studies planned, really not only in isolation for the network in EMA, but also with the European Center for Disease Control, vaccine monitoring platform, HJs and payers, really trying to make use of this across as many of the health authority uh, and, and uh, research and regulators that exist. Five studies already completed and the launch of the website. We can actually go in and see some further details if you'd like to look into that and explore anonymized data from these uh, results that have been generated. Even more so, the involvement of Darwin, EU being the trailblazer for the European health data space. So really executing on the pilot work under the French uh, uh, health data hub uh, that is leading the initiative and participation here from EMA, uh, Finland, Denmark, Croatia and France uh, to, to develop this use case. Then data quality and representativeness, also something that is really of key relevance for the veterinary area, really that we have now adopted a data quality framework and uh, we are preparing to exemplify the use of that with different uh, different public consultations and the use of that. It really sets a language across many different data types and uses. So we, we, we talk the same talk as we talk data quality. Then data discoverability, um, and I know this is something on your agenda as well, is really having a catalog of available data sources. There are many of them out there. We need to revitalize that to basically replace the existing NCEV resource database and then also have a catalog of non-interventional studies and really ensure that we fill that data into the EU PASS registry so we have a comprehensive overview of the real-world data efforts uh, across the continent. All of this requires that we upskill, uh, so we are really working diligently to roll out relevant training modules for the EU regulatory network on both data science and pharmacopoeia Although the use case in data science may be of human nature, the concepts are the same for veterinary. As a matter of fact, when we talk data science in the AI uh, meeting earlier this week, there's some really, really good examples of pharmacovigilance within the space of the veterinary. But it's quite impressive results from some of the universities. So obviously mutually something to learn uh, from each other in that space. The network processes we are reviewing, we are reporting on how we actually faring with the use of real-world evidence is really in increasing numbers, both at the EMA, but also in the network in, in itself. A number of activities across the different committees as well, where the evidence generated by real-world is being fed into the decision-making process, really leading to the change we decide this to be, and with further evidence really strengthening our decision-making. Then the network capability to analyze, uh, we are deeply into uh, the uh, raw data pilot, as we call it, where we get the data from the applicants to do our own statistical assessment um, halfway through a year to go. We have now uh, issued and are starting to adopt a multi-year AI work plan, taking stock of technology developments 
Uh, that goes to the HMA uh, meeting next week and to the EMA management board in December. We've actually vetted it, this through the, the network already. It really speaks about experimentation of the use of AI, the learning from that, and really to advise ourselves about how we see this uh, space evolve. Then delivery of expert advice. Uh, the methodology working party is really starting to show its value where we think across different specialities and domains as we are being challenged with new uh, kind of technology advancements, new methodology potentials that are out there in analytics. So we bring data science, biostat modeling, real world data experts together. And as you see, we then establish these uh, expert groups underneath mm -hmm. in brief called SX. And on AI, there are 51 people attending across the network and the real-world evidence, 79 people. So there's a vast amount of experts out there we can actually make use of in our collaboration. And as I said, the public consultation around AI is ongoing. In particular, there's a reflection paper with a deadline towards the end of the year that is still out there. Governance framework. We've just refreshed our governance framework for the Big Data Steering Group. Just to let you know that we now have a new mandate until 25 that really looks at how to strike the right balance between what we do in Big Data Steering Group and what's done in other data governance uh, entities. And also we are strengthening the collaboration across the board. We also, and we really liked the participation of Ilaria in the past. She's been a very good voice in that. We're really looking forward to, to have Ilaria's replacement in there, obviously having the veterinaries in together with all of the other relevant stakeholders. And then uh, the need for data protection uh, training for medicines and public health, really something we have delivered on as well. There's a need to harmonize on these topics, uh, otherwise we're left to somewhat uh, individual assessments uh, that may vary across the different NCAs. And obviously then support ESGS and pharma strategy in what we do. Uh, on the final uh, piece here, uh, just ensuring that we do support international initiatives, really trying to lead on these topics on the IFPA but also to take harmonization further to ICH, something we hear our surroundings, the industry really desiring that we do. So uh, that is something that the EMA and the network is leading on. And then making sure we do constant engagement with our surroundings, the Real World Data Quality Workshop uh, earlier in June this year. We have two biannual BDSG and industry meetings. One is actually coming up here on Monday. Uh, big Data Newsletter, as you see here, we'll get that to the end. And here on the 4th of December, a full day with the multi-stakeholder forum where interesting topics like AI and uh, quantum computing will also be discussed as we start to look a little bit further, but also make sure we do put, put the patient in the center of that with patient evidence uh, and patient experience data in there. Then finally, the veterinary recommendations, but I'll probably leave most of that to talk into that, but we're very much aware about this and do look into that. Our work plan actually uh, is being marked with a small V whenever where there's an initiative that is mutually beneficial between us. So we do keep an eye out for that and make sure we do collaborate on that. Just a few things, as I said, uh, what we're going to do, increase the number of studies and data partners in Darwin, so that really progresses as expect, expected. Quality uh, framework is being launched and, and further qualified, and also with European health data space. The real world uh, data and studies catalog to really intensify the engagement of the patient's organization around that data as well, because patient experience data is not that readily available. We need to improve on that. We just came out of ActiU discussing e-health or digital endpoint data as a next topic of, uh, of importance to look into. Uh, the rollout of training of regulators, there's a whole new range of competencies to be established if they're not already there. And it also goes with genomics. The processes to report on how we are faring on real-world evidence in our decision-making and also starting to look into genomics and the patient uh, experience data. And then the raw uh, clinic or the clinical trial raw data uh, and also going into non-clinical raw data. So establish our capability to analyze alongside with the use of AI are the focus areas for the next two years. Um, the real world evidence guidance by the methodology working party to be launched in the uh, consultation here in 24, uh, which is much, much in request by our surroundings. The data strategy, network data strategy, support of initiative to both tethers which is the kind of blueprint of European health data space towards European health data space, European health data space and pharma strategy itself. The ICMA collaboration as a highlight that continues to be a focus area. 
and the methodology and research and the work on registries together with stakeholders and continued stakeholder engagement. And then finally, uh, the support to the big data work plan on veterinary and the strategy you have in the data source catalogs and other initiatives. So really just leave it there to further information that is available on the website with newsletters that can also be a source of further information. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jesper. So uh, we'll move to the next talk. So um, about the EMA Veterinary Big Data Work Plan and which will be presented by Sandra Bertula. So uh, Sandra is a um, uh, vet by training and uh, she first uh, worked in the field of uh, university research for several uh, years, especially on uh, bovine uh, health management as well as animal reproduction. And uh, she was responsible for uh, several studies using, uh, so she has a good experience about uh, data farm management systems and also advanced analytics. So, and since uh, February uh, 2020, she's uh, one of the veterinary members of the big data steering group. And uh, she also became the a member of the European VET big data team, for notably for the development of the European big data strategy and the use of advanced anal analytics and uh, emerging digital technologies in the veterinary domain. So Sandra, the floor is yours. So um, yeah, I'm giving this presentation in view of uh, Ilaria, um, who is one of the key persons to develop this work plan. And as we have heard, she's not here today. So um, I will give my best to present it um, to you. Um, actually, um, the work plan um, is um, based on the uh, big data um, uh, veterinary big data strategy um, that had been adopted in 2022, and it has five major pillars, ah, no, it's working, sorry. Um, yeah, and um, in, within the strategy, we already have um, a brief overview on how the strategy should be, um, should be uh, implemented by data collection, by data integration, and by data connection. However, um, there is not much detail given in the strategy. So um, when we had our Big Data Stakeholder Forum last year, um, it was concluded that um, in order to progress, we needed a veterinary big data work plan um, that should be interlinked um, with the identification and prioritization of um, use cases um, that uh, should be um, further implemented. In order um, um, to do that, we had um, first the identification. Um, so um, three major use cases were identified. It's uh, one of those is um, the VMP availability. The second one is um, pharmacovigilance. And the third one was um, antimicrobial resistance. And um, those um, three um, use cases are, again, the basis for the work plan and um, how to bring them into action. So um, this um, work plan is uh, more or less a step-by-step -step guidance on how to transpose the wet big data strategy. And in order to do that again, um, three um, major work streams were um, defined um, that I will um, explain a bit more now. So um, the first um, work stream is um, focused on analytics discoverability. Um, here um, we have um, covered those projects that um, um, are interlinked to the data landscape. Um, they, um, they started with the data landscape analysis research project that is already running. And here, um, Jos will um, give you further input after me. Then um, this project should be followed by um, the metadata, uh, metadata analysis research project. And then hopefully um, we will finalize a veterinary data source catalog. So this is um, uh, similar as uh, what has been done in human medicine already. Um, furthermore, um, in this work stream, we also have another data source, um, that's the antimicrobial sales and use database. Um, this one is uh, nearly ready to be launched, that um, will be done uh, at the beginning of 2024. And finally, we have the um, UPD data quality framework. Um, I think most of you have already um, seen this one, has been promoted at the beginning of this year. 
um, and it is used to enhance um, the, uh, the data quality and the completeness of the UPD. Um, finally, there is the Vetra Data Profiling Project um, that is, uh, should be launched um, at the end of um, this year. Um, it uh, shall be used um, to uh, profile VMPs um, based on um, their SPCs, indication, mode of action, and adverse events in order to um, further enable risk-based approaches for um, the uh, signal detection and management so for pharmacovigilance. And as you see, we have the antimicrobials here, we have um, the availability here, and again, we have um, pharmacovigilance. So those are linked to our three use cases. Um, going to the next pillar, um, it's uh, the focus on the governance and literacy. Uh, literacy. Um, here, um, one of the major um, focuses on, uh, are on the training needs um, regarding veterinary big data and advanced um, technologies. So on the one hand, um, it's our task to review the current training curricula, um, but and um, there to identify um, knowledge gaps, for example, um, by contributing to a survey that um, shall be launched at the beginning of next year, um, where uh, network training needs are assessed. Furthermore, um, we are supporting um, the development of the new NTC training materials um, that are currently um, developed um, for the big data curriculum. Um, um, moreover, um, we are um, trying to address the challenges for um, uh, using commercially available uh, confidential data. So, for example, on how um, a big data could be used to predict crises like um, shortages of uh, um, uh, veterinary medicinal products, um, for the development of antimicrobial resistances, but also for disease outbreaks. And finally, um, and this is um, maybe the most important um, um, uh, milestone that has been reached this year, is uh, the establishment of the VET, um, EU VET Data Hub. Um, this Data Hub um, was um, formally uh, introduced in June this year. Um, and um, it's um, consisting of members uh, from EMA and from different member states. Um, so far, we have uh, France, Spain, uh, Germany. Um, we have colleagues from Portugal, from Belgium, from Sweden. And um, there, um, this um, just um, to, to explain it for, or, or, um, where it's organized, it's um, reporting to the Veterinary Strategic Focus Group. And it is meant uh, to be um, a central reference for stakeholders, but also for other um, agencies and institutions uh, regarding um, everything that is related to uh, veterinary um, new data science uh, technologies. Um, so um, information should be shared and um, uh, the awareness of big data and everything that is connected or integrated in big data um, should be uh, raised. Um, and um, the use of real-world evidence should be promoted. Um, this um, um, the VET Big Data Work Plan. So um, it was in this group, um, it, um, the work was done to identify and pri prioritize the use cases. Um, there is a lead on the VET Data Landscape Analysis, and um, also what I already explained with the training needs. Um, this is also discussed and um, further worked on in this, in this group. Um, furthermore, um, it's um, the idea to support veterinary research questions, um, always uh, regarding analytics and methodology um, for everything that's related to big data and new technologies. And um, perhaps in the future, um, again, um, referring to what I was just by saying, is um, to um, develop new guidance documents um, that could be used for regulatory uh, purposes um, in this field. Also, um, we are trying to contribute to the human vet cross-domain activities. Um, as you have seen, um, a lot of those um, things I explained now for our veterinary work plan are uh, going in parallel or in, uh, linked um, with the um, big data stream group work plan. And um, so we are trying to um, use those synergies and uh, profit from the knowledge that has already been um, acquired in the human domain. So um, for um, the last um, uh, um, yeah, key point or pillar, it's as a focus on the stakeholder engagement, and that is what we are doing now and here. <laughs> so um, we are um, organizing, or it's um, in the veterinary big data stakeholder forums are organized. Um, so um, now we have the third one, and as um, Eva was already saying, we are um, already thinking about the fourth one for next year. But um, besides that, um, uh, the EU Veterinary Big Data webpage was launched um, this year um, in, in 
late spring. So if um, you are looking um, for information, um, you can assess this page. And um, yeah, there we have um, the work plan. We have information on the data hub and also on upcoming events. Um, moreover, um, the, the um, veterinary um, data hub um, is um, part of the veterinary highlights newsletter that is um, published regularly. And um, we are also um, having sometimes um, um, articles in the big data highlights. And with that, um, this is a, a work plan in total. <laughs> so um, what we want to achieve until 2025. Um, this is a lot of work and um, comparing to what we have done the three years before, um, it is really growing and um, I think it's a huge opportunity. And um, yeah, I hope um, I presented um, what is our intention and um, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. So now the um, next talk is about the U European Veterinary Data Landscape Analysis with um, Dr. Jos Verstegen. Uh, so um, Dr. Verstegen uh, is working at, uh, in research at uh, Wageningen University and uh, then he, he graduated in animal health, in animal science, sorry, and um, his PhD was already on the um, value of management information systems in livestock farming. So um, now he's in a then, uh, further research project uh, he worked on, where uh, include uh, work on innovation, entrepreneurship, and data-driven uh, business models, and big data platforms and data warehouses. So Jos is now uh, leading the EMA project, uh, Big Data in Veterinary Medicines Regulation, and about uh, data landscape analysis. So Jos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, extensive introduction. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I can almost stop uh, now, but uh, my PhD was indeed on information systems in the previous century. So I hope we can uh, add some new things uh, to it uh, in the meantime. Uh, I'm very happy uh, on behalf of Wageningen Research. Uh, I'm actually not from the university, but I will explain a little bit about your organization uh, later. Uh, I'm very happy that I can introduce uh, on behalf of, of the team uh, that we have uh, and, uh, and on behalf of the, the, the people that we collaborate with uh, within EMA uh, to present uh, the, the progress that we have made in this uh, project. Can I have my slides? Yeah. So as you see, we are with, with a big uh, team with, with people from different uh, business units within uh, Wageningen Research. And uh, our task is to, uh, yeah, to, to make uh, uh, work from the, the, the plans that were already developed and the initiatives that were already taken in the human domain uh, to see if we can uh, do similar things and learn and adapt uh, from this human domain uh, for the veterinary domain. So this is what I hope to do in 20 minutes. I'll, who are we? Why are we doing this? And what are we doing? And then uh, hopefully you have some time for the next steps. Otherwise, we can have a discussion uh, afterwards. So this is the, the front hall that you entered uh, today. Uh, if you are here, uh, we work uh, very closely with the EMA. And although Ilaria uh, left the organization, we could still capture her on this uh, picture. So we are very happy with that. And we have also uh, people who are not on the picture that were on holiday, like myself. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, I'm very happy to say, because it's a new domain and we had to get used to each other, but we really uh, work well uh, together. Uh, although, and that's also expressed in the sentence next to it, we are a very in the independent uh, research organization. And everything I say here today is also uh, on account of, of Wageningen research, and uh, but uh, of course we collaborate uh, very well. Just a few words on the organization, because Wageningen University and Research is a big organization, big 6,000 people working there in five uh, different uh, groups, uh, ranging from the 
agrotechnology, animal science, environmental science, plant science, and social science. And then we have a special unit to the to the lower left. It's the Wageningen Food Safety Research, who is a let's say a government organization under the umbrella of Wageningen University and Research, but fully independent uh, for the for the government. And the people in our group are from these three uh, units. So the Wageningen Food Safety Research. Uh, we have many uh, colleagues of uh, Wageningen Bioveterinary Research. Uh, in this uh, field, who are of course very much uh, involved in, in in zoonotics, using data, generating data in the labs, uh, and then myself uh, and some colleagues are from Wageningen uh, Economic Research, and uh, we are very much involved in various projects on uh, data platforms, uh, data science, data spaces, uh, blockchain, AI, all the the words that already was were mentioned uh, before, and. Uh, yeah, I must say, uh, within a few years, we have uh, moved to a situation where now uh, 20 to 25 percent of all our employees are more or less working in this in this area, and also on the social, uh, economic, and uh, ethics uh, aspects so on, on business models, uh, algorithms, uh, ethics, governance, and uh, I think that's uh, very useful to 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 put this in this uh, in this project. Yeah, just just one picture to 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 give an idea what we are doing. And someone from the environmental agency here, so maybe they don't like it, but we are drilling here, and actually we are drilling in a blue ocean, and we are not drilling for oil but for data. And uh, many people say, okay, data is the new oil, so that may be the analog, but blue ocean is also very important because maybe some people, if you know, blue ocean strategy, it means that when some technologies allow for for data or other things to become much cheaper, then all, all kind of new markets and solutions uh, pop up. And uh, if a company or an institution has a blue ocean strategy, then you make use of this new uh, development. And that's actually what we are doing here. And yeah, maybe for the most of the in the audience, it's uh, maybe uh, uh, already uh, known language, known uh, uh, stuff, but. Uh, we 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 know that big data has very big potential, uh, and to, to improve animal health and also the re relation, of course, with with one health to the environment and the human health, and uh, real world data can be used to improve the evidence and support the uh, the regulatory uh, work of, uh, done at EMA. And. The speed of the, the, the new technologies, uh, I was mentioning I was working with information systems in the previous century, and then everything was entered manually in, in systems. Now most of the data is automatically recorded by, by sensors, by satellites, by drones, by all kinds of uh, uh, devices. And there's a lot of data connected in platforms, and that gives a lot of potential for developing uh, new solutions. And also in this uh, veterinary domain, the diagnostics, the monitoring and predictive technologies uh, are providing more data and are also providing more solutions. The data, you can be aggregated and are aggregated at this moment to, to build, to build sorry, veterinary intelligence systems. And in that way, you can create uh, new knowledge, new insights and uh, work uh, towards uh, better health outcomes, uh, both in the human and veterinary domain, and also uh, take into account this ecotoxicity or the environmental uh, impact. As I mentioned, uh, many things are collected automatically already, and uh, so with this, with with less uh, administrative burden, much more is possible now because of these new technologies. Yeah, so we focus on the veterinary domain, but the issues here are not uh, unique, and uh, and and uh, the, the 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 possibilities are not unique. So that's why everyone is drilling for this uh, new oil. And uh, you can see that uh, we sometimes say there's a, a battlefield of of companies and institutions trying to get hold of uh, data. And uh, to combine data, it's, it's both going on in the in the private and uh, public sector. And 
it's because of this new oil ID, but there's uh, also uh, two schools in that. Some people say da data itself is, is nothing because data is just something that is included in the system. And others say, yeah, data is really the, 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 the driving force for the future. And both schools uh, are right because data in itself is not very worthwhile, uh, but when combined and given meaning to, it becomes very uh, uh, important and valuable. So that's the challenge to, to make sure that you get meaning to it. But then the issues, uh, because everything is possible and technology allows for a lot, but there's also a lot of concerns. And it's also mentioned in the, in the previous uh, presentation that uh, the governance the framework is very important. But that sounds maybe for many people a little bit abstract, but when I talk to farmers, then they say, what happens when I share my data? Uh, who will get it? Can it be used against me? Uh, is there some some uh, activist group that goes to court and say, I want to have this data. And then maybe the, the judge uh, uh, um, uh, decides that indeed this data should be public. And then it's already, uh, let's say, open in the public and uh, some farmers can have problems with it. And that's not only unique to farmers, but can be in, in all kinds of uh, circumstances. So that's, there needs to be some good governance framework to make sure that uh, trust is built and, and data is shared. And other issues uh, concern the power balance. Uh, in, for example, in supply chains, who gets the data? Is, is a farmer just uh, someone who gets, uh, let's say, uh, some instructions from another supply chain partner to, to do uh, this and this because this uh, supply chain farmer is, uh, partner is monitoring the farm? Or is it that the farmer is still in control of, of his or, or her own data? And that also has to do with making the good uh, decisions and uh, make sure that you uh, make this good governance framework and take into account all the ethics aspects. And it's also, again, true for, for the private and for the public uh, domain. And then what's in it for me? Because uh, I, I did a project with contract workers who do a lot of field work for farmers. They collect a lot of data. They spend thousands of euros on sensor technology and GPS and uh, improve the agriculture by precision farming. But do they get benefit from it when they share the data to the farmer and when the precision agriculture allows for a better production? That's also the new business models have to be developed for that. So there's a lot of issues, but at the same time, uh, as I mentioned before, we, we are involved in, in many projects. Uh, I, I just mentioned a few of them, Internet of Farm and Food, Smart Agri-Hubs, Agri-Data Space, uh, Data for Food. Those are all European projects who work exactly on these issues. And at the same time, in practice, you see all kinds of data hubs. Uh, the, the, the VET Data Hub is mentioned here, but in France, they have the Ag Data Hub. In, in Belgium, they have to just connect. In, in Germany, they have the agri-router. In the Netherlands, we have joint data. There's all uh, data hubs who collect data uh, or share data, uh, spread data to the different uh, people that can use the data. But they also need this, this governance framework for it. And uh, that's what we are doing in this uh, projects to make sure that trust is built and that only data are shared that has to be shared and for the purpose that it has to be shared and for the time that it has to be used. And that can all be arranged by, for example, white listing of companies who uh, obey to, uh, to code of conduct and so on. See if we can. So what are we doing now? We first started because this is the first project in the framework uh, project. Um, we don't know what we know. So there's a lot of data collected everywhere and some may be useful, some may not be useful, um, but we don't know yet. So we have to start by looking through the, the internet and especially in the literature, what kind of data is collected uh, out there in the, in the different uh, European uh, member states, especially, but also in, in Canada, in the USA. And that's what we are doing now. We, we start with the literature research. It's a little bit slow in this. 
I go too quickly. Yeah, okay. So the, the general question for our research is, can data sources on animal health be identified? Uh, can we find them out there? The first thing and fair principle is findable. So can we find the data sources that can be used to support key regulatory activities? We don't know that yet. We don't know what's out there. We don't know if it's useful, but we are going to to, to search for them. And we started with uh, in the collaboration with our Wageningen library uh, using very specific queries with, with keywords to look through all the possible databases in uh, scientific publications, uh, in statistical databases, for example, Eurostat, in which we also collaborate as, uh, as Wageningen Economic Research in all kinds of uh, reports, not only by EMA, but also EFSA, Environmental Agency, and so on. Gray literature is also studied and in uh, research uh, data repositories. Yeah, we are in the middle of this, uh, so we we are very strict in the keywords. So to make sure that we have a very selective uh, list of uh, data sources, now we came up with 121 uh, sources. Most of it uh, is uh, on a European in, in European member states, but we are in the middle of this. So you can see a little bit that we uh, are working in the different. Uh, member states so what kind of topics do we find in these uh, sources uh, so far most of it is on uh, on residues uh, and microbial use which is not very strange because there's a lot of data collected already in this so a lot of academics and so on uh, have this data available to do research that also shows that if you have data available uh, it also generates more research in that area but we are in the middle of this. And okay, one of the things that I could mention, we will try to allocate those uh, literature sources to the to the life cycle uh, that uh, is used by EMA uh, to see if, if data is used in the research development phase, in the authorization phase, or can be used or is used in the post authorization. And then uh, the second uh, task that we are working on is the survey. Many of you maybe have already had a request to, to complete the survey. Uh, we do it in uh, many different organizations, both in the public domain and in the private domain. I will not mention all of them. The size of the, 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 the ball uh, indicates a little bit of how many uh, we expect to, to contact in this uh, area. Uh, the snowball means that we have contacted people and they mentioned you should not have me, but contact this person. So from one person, we we have a lead to another person. And that's what uh, in the literature is called the snowballing method. And so we, we got a lot of useful comments uh, there. And uh, so now we have around uh, 1,000 uh, surveys uh, spread and... Uh, we have some response on that, fortunately. It's, a, it's quite diverse, the response. Most of the response that we have is uh, from the veterinarians to, for, to the right. So probably the FVE had a very good recommendation letter uh, and the veterinarians were very obedient, you could say, to respond to our request. Uh, so on the left uh, on the Y axis, you see that uh, over 300 respondents were there and 69% almost was very useful, so it means that they were completed uh, in, a, in a good way. And uh, to, the, to the left, we see the pharmaceutical industry, which is uh, a little bit hesitating, I think. Uh, hopefully, in the near future and after this speech, we will get more feedback from them as well. Then the last part, the metadata catalog, was also mentioned already uh, in the previous speech. And uh, we are very happy that we are collaborating very well with uh, also Anna Cochina from the human uh, catalog domain, you can say, because uh, there's a lot of work already uh, done. And uh, I think they had a, a few years uh, a project uh, in the Minerva uh, project. So they, they had a very extensive list and they uh, tested it in the field and they, they, they converged it a little bit to, uh, to a smaller list, which is more uh, usable in practice. And those phases we are going through at this moment as well, uh, that uh, 
we started with a, with, a, with a long list from the, the, the Minerva project, and we used the veterinary <coughs> expertise to see if the same uh, data entities, variables can be used also in the veterinary domain. And we, we uh, indicated that around 60 of them need to be adjusted, but most of them can still be used. So that's very good starting point. Speed up a little bit. Metadata list. Uh, so it had originally 442 elements. It is reduced to less than 100. And we go through the same phase now, adjusting to the veterinary domain. Next steps. As I mentioned, we are uh, in the middle of those three uh, elements, the literature, research, survey, and the metadata catalog, making good progress, I think. Uh, next step will be, after we have finalized that, see if the catalog works well. We already had one-on-one -on -one contacts with people uh, uh, who are data holder for, for data sets, and we can look if they can really complete this, uh, put all the variables in the in the catalog for that. Then we will have some more in-depth interviews, and then we will move and make uh, the link to the use cases that were also uh, mentioned uh, by Sandra to see if we can use these data sources to improve the, the work in the antimicrobial uh, resistance uh, domain, the, the the, what is the other one, the Union Product Database and the Pharmacovigilance. And then, of course, yeah, we, we will see what we can find, what is useful for the regulatory framework. And then, of course, uh, to, to make it successful, uh, we need to have somehow access to the data. So we will give recommendations on how to build uh, the, the governance around it and how to make sure that it's safe to, to share data uh, and also very important that it has a very little administrative burden for the data holders to share the data. And uh, of course, the, the final goal is that it gives maximum impact for the public task of, uh, of AMA with, uh, with the, using the data in the, in the future. That's, that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, yes, for this nice, very nice presentation. So, um, so you compare big data to oil. So I don't know if it will be also restricted to some countries. I hope not. <laughs> but uh, well, we so now we have some uh, question in in the chat. So we have a few minutes to answer to some of them. Uh, so I will need your help to get the question. Yeah. So. No, we we just agreed that uh, Laura needs my help because she can't read the questions. It's too small print for her. So uh, I will I will do that. There's a, uh, there's a question in the chat from uh, Silvia Oliveira. Uh, the question is, what were the conditions met changed changes that allowed the possibility to increase the number of projects and work done in the last three years when compared to previous years? And do you consider there is stability to continue this positive increase? And it came directly after Sandra, after your uh, presentation uh, and um, when I, when I it, 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 let me take that question when I reflected a bit on that uh, it, it, there were several factors that I think influenced why we saw this increase over the past three years the, the first driver was the implementation of the new veterinary regulation which forced us also to start collecting data uh, and and where we felt we should do, look more into analysis of these data and that then triggered also, uh, shouldn't we look at data outside what we are already collecting under the uh, uh, regulation and, and include that. Then the next important uh, thing was that we, for the first time in the history of the veterinary medicines division, we generated a, a budget to do research and research in the broader sense, asking uh, uh, partners to do work that normally we would not be in a position to do either because we don't have the resources, the expertise or the work. And, and I think the presentation, the last presentation by uh, Jos Stegen uh, is a clear example of that. It's something that, yes, we wanted to do, but we were never able to do. We don't have the network. We don't have the, the expertise. We don't have the time to, uh, to dive into uh, to that. Then a, 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 a clear driver was also the fact that we did uh, 
develop a big data strategy, specifically a veterinary big data strategy that we shared with the network, shared with the stakeholders, because before 2020, we did not have uh, such, a, such a strategy. It's, it was new. It was following from the work done uh, on the human side where they where they uh, did a similar exercise, the HMA working group, which resulted in a, I think was it a 90 page or an over 100 page uh, document uh, on looking at data out there and, and, and how it could be used. That was that was published probably four, four or five years ago. And we did something similar, but also something simpler and made it very pragmatic. And, and, and that also helped us to, to define concrete actions. And then last but not least, I think that the definition of use cases that has helped us enormously to say, where are we going to focus our efforts? And uh, what was presented uh, by Sandra as well is the, the phased approach that we were, were looking at. So we, we didn't uh, have the ambition to do everything at the same time. We said we should start with this, try and deliver on that and, and make a start with it. So then the, the second part of your question, do I consider there is stability to continue this positive increase? And that depends on how you look at it. We came from zero to doing something. So that was a, a relatively huge increase. Now we're doing something and now we have to keep that train rolling and, and, and improve. For me, possibly it's more important that we actually start showing the value and start delivering and, and, and show where the added value is for uh, the regulatory network, both for the industry as well as for uh, farmers, veterinarians, as well as for the national competent authorities. And, and by demonstrating that, I think that will be an, another, give another impulse on further developing it. That, that would be my answer to that question. The second question uh, from, um, let me check briefly, from Susanna Schwanbeck from Fraunhofer Institute. Um, and that relates to the use of real world evidence data directly uh, to the environment as there is no big database uh, for ecotox and, and data for pharmaceuticals uh, and, and that exist in the EU. We have people from the environmental agency connected as well, but um, uh, I think from my side, uh, I would like to say that it's true, we, we don't have a a really big database on pharmaceuticals in the environment, but there are several drivers that will, uh, I think in the future, uh, make it necessary that we are going to invest in that, in collecting data from different sources on pharmaceuticals in the environment, or let's call it substances in the environment, because a lot of substances are uh, being used both as pharmaceuticals as well as herbicides, uh, veterinary medicine, medicinal products, human medicinal products. Uh, and uh, there is an increasing interest, of course, for the environment and for seeing how we can manage uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the contamination of the environment and how we can monitor it. Uh, that, that may very well be different data sources for different substances or for different applications of substances. But I think the, the big data challenge is to bring them together and to, uh, uh, to link them with databases on the actual use of these substances, whether as herbicides, fungicides, uh, or in veterinary or human medicine, medicines, and then see where the links are. And I think big data is an important a hugely important tool that can help us in, in, in trying to elucidate that and see what the impact is of reducing, for example, the use in some areas on, on the environment. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and for now we have to deal with whatever data there is, there is available, either through studies or through actual monitoring programs. And I know that, for example, Wageningen University, not the part where Jos is working, but that they do studies on uh, surface water uh, uh, contamination or in the presence of substances uh, there. Um, and I saw, uh, uh, Dario, do you want to add to this? So we can uh, open your mic, I think, and then you can, uh, I think you agreed with what I said. Yes, indeed. Hi, hi, Ivo. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Yes, no, I, I will actually elaborate a little bit on this in my presentation, so I don't want to, you know, say too much right now, but I completely agree, actually, what, what, what you 
uh, suggested is exactly um, also something that we are uh, discussing internally, <laughs> struggling with. Um, the main issue, of course, uh, in uh, in uh, strengthening this, you know, the use of big data for our collaboration is precisely that sometimes we don't yet have either the data on the environmental side or the data more on the youth side. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunities, but we need to, of course, to um, to fill these data gaps first of all. Um, to uh, and then, of course, there are opportunities already to 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 collaborate by increasing the discoverability and the reusability of the data, integrating it. But uh, the, the data availability, uh, for example, for the monitoring of pharmaceuticals in the environment is indeed a challenge to, uh, to increase this collaboration. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, just before moving to the, the next session, I would like to just ask a question to, um, to, to uh, Jesper. Uh, because I, I thought, according to to your experience uh, with the big data steering group uh, and on the human side, in a few words, uh, what would you say about uh, the the main benefits and limits uh, that um, big data could have for the the development, uh, authorization, and regulation of veterinary medicinal products? Well, I, I think we, we are starting to see some very important stuff within pharmacovigilance and safety, especially, right, where I think the continuous monitoring and I think the One Health approach we, talk, we hear about here in terms of finding substances in nature also is on the human side, something that is becoming of increasing interest. So I think we have some mutual potential here to look more holistically at the data and use that in a continued surveillance approach. I think that's where we really have some some. Uh, joint effort and benefit from, from using the data. And the infrastructure is being established. We are going more green as we look at some of these things. So also in the Nordic countries, we're looking at the sustainability of medicines, uh, CO2 footprint and, and uh, whatever they leave in nature, right? So, and that goes together with uh, pharmacovigilance, the ability to actually look at the safety profile together as well. So, uh... Thank you. So I move to uh, session two, Sandra. Yeah, um, thank you, Laura. Um, so yeah, we will go on with the second session um, of today. And this is focusing on the use cases um, we already introduced. So um, we have three very interesting speakers that will um, give us a feedback on their views on um, the current ongoing projects on uh, the use cases. So um, the first speaker um, I can introduce is Katharina Sterling. Um, Katharina um, is giving us an indust industry's view. Um, she is a much, much appreciated and recurring uh, speaker in the relation to veterinary big data. Um, she is the director of regulatory affairs for Suetis and focusing on uh, companion animals. Um, as a background, um, Kat has a degree in biology and a PhD in veterinary immunology. And um, she did a very impressive um, way until she, she arrived at Suetis because she started at university research then went to the Veterinary Medicinal Directorate in the um, in UK, and then she finally um, joined Pfizer and um, what is now Suetas. So, um, Kat, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Is this working okay? Hopefully it is. Um, uh, who's got control of the slides? <laughs> Me? You. Okay. Uh, are they coming? <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, uh, we're going to switch tack quite a lot here and give you a slightly different view on this. A lot of what we've heard in this first session is more around um, obviously the, the data strategy from the agency point of view and a more of a kind of research point of view and a little bit more focused on what's useful to the regulators in terms of monitoring medicines, etc. I'm going to talk a bit more here about the way in which industry look at this and what our core, core focus on is really is how it can help us in terms of innovation and supporting those regulatory decision-making to bring forward new products or to enhance our existing products. Um, big picture. So, Jos gave you one view. This is coming at it from a slightly different view. And some of these data sources I'm going to mention here, some of them are information that's publicly available that everybody has access to. And some of it may be data sources that are only kind of more restricted to an individual company or an industry basis. So, um, we as industry have access to a different set of data, including some of which is confidential to us, depending on what it is. And this goes all the way through from the kind of information that can contribute to real world data, our historical clinical trial data, new clinical trial data, and anything else that 
we may have access to in terms of products and commercial sources. So this can be all the way through from active monitoring systems, thinking about AI-driven monitoring systems, data loggers, activity monitors, disease epidemiology information that can support medicines needs and policy decisions, including um, disease incidence information. Different sort of um, veterinary data collection systems, so um, uh, veterinary practice um, data aggregating systems like Vet Compass and Savsnet. And Savsnet was one of the ones that was, there was a presentation from them in the AI workshop at the beginning of the week, and that gave some insight into what they're starting to do using AI, et cetera, to mine data within those types of systems. Various other digital systems that collect patient information, so PIMS, practice management systems, but there's also now a lot which people may have started to see, these kind of pet owner and vet apps that help connect, you know, the virtual vet kind of apps. The thing that those systems do also is they're collecting information. They're sources of data around pets, disease, medicines, diagnosis, and, and that sort of thing. And often that can give you longitudinal information over time also. There's also a lot of evolution in terms of genetic information, microbiome, to give a couple of examples of things that Zoetis have. We have Clarified, which is a livestock product, and then BasePause, which is companion animal, currently only available in the US, but that's collecting genetic information on companion animals for cats, and we've just launched the dog product. And then also diagnostic data. And diagnostic data is also much more powerful when it's linked to that patient information. So that's one key factor with all of this type of data. The power of that data, the relevance of that data grows when you're able to link it with different types of information. So, for example, diagnostic data linked with information about medicines used or the actual diagnosis of the animal, the age, the weight, the sex, the breed, all that kind of information is very valuable to us in industry as we're developing. Some of it is really only relevant early in development. Some of it's something that will find its way through into regulatory submissions. And all of this information, it has the potential to combine to help provide real world evidence that can support regulatory decision making in the context of our regulatory submissions, and also in the context of demonstrating and supporting the benefit risk of a new medicine or a new indication, for example. And how we use approaches like this to improve speed to market, medicines availability, and provide better data on which to make decisions is key in supporting innovation. So just a little bit more of the power of data. I'm going to switch through this section quite quickly because Jesper's given you quite a nice introduction to what they're doing on human health and that's one of the places we've started to look what are they doing in that space and the regulatory uses this I borrowed from the one of the presentations from the um, the real world evidence um, workshops that were held at the beginning of June time um, in the summer um, just really to highlight that real world evidence is being used throughout life cycle in a variety of cases orphan designations, clinical trial planning, pharmacovigilance we've heard touched on. But if you think about in the vet context, rare diseases, rare indications, but also useful in how we design clinical studies, especially for new medicines areas. Um, so clinical trial planning, feasibility and optimization, digital endpoints and digital therapeutics, label extensions on existing medicines, um, pharmacovigilance is in the bottom. You'll notice I didn't highlight that because really the focus of this talk is about innovation, but it is also, as everybody's mentioned, another key area where big data and large data sources are potentially useful. And this I thought was quite a nice kind of um, image of the different ways in which we're doing this. So we can use different ways to meet evidence requirements. So thinking about it, weight of evidence. So, and complementary data streams. So we're all used to randomized clinical trials, RCTs, highly select patient populations, controlled conditions, limited duration follow-up, higher internal validity in GCP. Real world data, totally different. Heterogeneous populations, absolutely critical in veterinary practice. Routine practice conditions and settings, and if you can imagine that in the context of veterinary medicine, that can be very, very diverse. And it also provides the possibility for longer term um, follow up, reflecting diverse patient behaviours. You think about in veterinary medicine, it's not just the patient, it's the owner, it's the vet, it's the environmental conditions. But it also gives us higher external generalizability. So there may be things that we, we have limited data on in a small clinical trial setting. When you look at it in a much bigger population, you can understand that much better, whether that is efficacy, safety or any of those aspects that help us 
overall build a data set that will support the benefit risk of a product or an indication. This, I think, more focus on the, the diagram here. So the traditional way of using real world data, it's what probably we used to call outcomes research, is you know, what, what were we doing before? It's like post approval, what does it look like? It's what everybody knows historically as outcomes research. Um, and that is places where we're using it. But now we're using it much more all the way through from supporting pivotal evidence post approval, sorry, pre approval. Um, secondary indications, so you know, a medicine may be approved with an initial indication and then you're using real world evidence to support new indications, or also in what really calling an adaptive pathway where you're moving between a conditional and a full approval. And in, this, in addition to what may be a pivotal clinical trial, you're also providing real world evidence of what's happening in the field with that medicine because it's out there, it's being used. And I don't just mean pharmacovigilance data. I actually mean in the potential of efficacy data. So we're all used to the fact that you're monitoring safety, but not so used to the idea of actually collecting efficacy data. And that has a real potential to really add a huge amount of value in the regulatory decision-making process and for us as industry in understanding the medicine, but also for veterinarians in terms of understanding the product. It builds a much better data set. And it's not one or the other. So it's not, you know, that we are going to switch completely from <laughs> our traditional RCT trials, but they can work together and be very complementary. Clinical trial data will remain key for medicines development and registration, but the real world evidence can complement it. It can enhance our understanding of our clinical trial data. And in some cases, it may be the only option to fully substantiate efficacy, if you think about rare indications and that sort of thing, or long-term chronic diseases where it's very difficult to understand what's going on, or where you're wanting to try and understand the benefit of the product at a herd or a population level, so beyond the individual animal. But it's also critical to enable its use that we understand a number of things. We understand the data sources and their validity, that we trust in the data and its relevance, and that's very important in terms of the context of use of structured data sources is really one of the key areas where AI and machine learning can come in, because that helps us. It's what I, they were starting to talk about with some of the vet compass data and AI is using AI and machine learning to help us mine some of these larger unstructured data sets. And also obviously policy and governance of data and data ownership. And we also know that talking to the regulators early and often is gonna be critical in our ability to actually realize the reality of using this. Um, I don't think there's anything in the legislation that prevents us using it, but I think it's gonna be a, a long road <laughs> to get there um, and a lot of test cases as we move forward. Um, Human medicine are doing this a lot. Yes, we touched on this. There are some recent publications that are suggesting some of the recent um, use cases, up to 100% of new medicines and the human health have had some form of real world evidence used in the context of registration. And I think that was accelerated very much recently with COVID and the way in which those vaccines were registered. So it's really given us a platform to understand what's possible. And as Jesper said earlier, all of what's happening in the human domain should be transferable in principle to what we're doing in the veterinary domain. Um, if anybody's interested, the real world evidence workshop, there's some interesting slides from there. And also the um, looking forward to seeing all the slides from the AI workshop earlier. The, certainly the presentations from um, SAVSnet will be interesting to look at. But as I say, all of those examples and use cases, there's no reason why they can't translate to the veterinary domain. So I'm just going to give you a few examples now, of the types of things we've been looking at, along with some actually data to support that. So using real world evidence can help us understand broader product benefits. So I touched on this already. So we're all used to understanding the effect on the individual animal with either laboratory studies or traditional RCT trials. But if we look at the new regulation, it opens the door to exploring benefits at the herd level and the population level. There's a change in the terminology from therapeutic benefit to benefit when it comes to products. And it's also considered within the regulatory science strategy that it's important that we also, we can look beyond the individual animal benefit. And I'm gonna show you a few examples of that now. Um, and this is around antimicrobial use. So this is two examples. Don't worry about the detail on the slide. There's a lot of information. The critical thing here is that it's our ability using large data sets to show the impact of a medicine on the reduction of antimicrobial use. So this is 
oxacitinib, which people know better as Apoquil. Um, so it's an um, antiparietis drug. Um, but what we've been able to show with it with large data sets, and I can find the mouse, um, this, this first slide is from a US study that had nearly 50,000 canine patients. So if you think about that compared to a clinical trial that maybe has 200, this is data looking at historical data in the US from over 1,000 veterinary hospitals and nearly 50,000 canine patients, showing a reduction in the use of antimicrobials um, to treat generally secondary infections when animals are treated for paritis with oxacitinib. And then the second example, this is data from Vet Compass in Australia, same sort of principle, but again, number of observations over 700,000. So well over half a million observations supporting. So that's what I mean about generalizability. So huge numbers of data sets. And it's not necessarily unexpected that if you're reducing secondary infections by treating the primary paritis that you're seeing this, but it's, it's much better when we've actually got we can substantiate that with data, in real world data. Um, these are The other nice thing with these is I thought I'd show them because they're graphical abstracts generated using AI. Um, so so they're, they're, they're nice to show in that context too. But the key message here is it's a large data set and it's showing the impact on, of a medicine on the reduction of antimicrobial use. And it's entirely possible the next step is to see whether medicines have a direct impact on the reduction of antimicrobial resistance. It was touched on earlier, you know, that may be something we can start to do as we explore real world evidence further. And then another area that's coming into more and more use is digital data capture using different sorts of devices. And major advances in technology are allowing more advanced and also objective ways to collect and measure data, both in a clinical trial setting and a real world setting. And one of the key things with this is that if these things are used both in a real world setting and in a clinical trial setting, it allows us much better to connect that information, you know, to connect the information generated by these monitoring systems in a clinical trial with what's actually happening in the field. And this can be all the way through from active herd monitoring systems in the livestock industry that can measure things like feed intake, methane emissions, milk yield, and other parameters. So you can have classic precision livestock medicine, um, but also then think about how that can translate through to measuring the impact of a medicine. Um, and then things like activity monitoring devices, where the algorithms can be trained using machine learning and AI to recognize itch, for example, or other types of activity that can translate to, for example, pain. So I'm going to show you two examples here. Um, the first one is something that's actually already approved. So this was looking to see whether there was anything in any of the pub EPARs around this. So this is Onsior. It's a pain medication. It's actually not one of ours. It's a, an Alanco medicine. But here they use activity monitors as an objective measure on how much pain the animal is in, essentially. So how much activity it's it's doing then translates to how much pain it may be in. It was justified based on publications. So there's a lot of publication information out there. And the important thing was that the CVAP included, concluded that for the purpose of the submission, and this was a, um, a claim extension, there was sufficient validation of the activity monitors to support their use to measure the efficacy. And this is a nice example I show you because it demonstrates it's being done already. And, you know, there are examples where CVMP have accepted this type of approach. And the next one, this is another one, um, slightly different thing. This is itch. So this is whistle fit activity monitors looking for puritic activities of itching in animals. Um, these are what they look like. They fit on the collar um, and they monitor all sorts of things. I'm not going to go into the detail in the interest of time. Um, <clears throat> but they looked at this in terms of validating the, the colors to show that where we sitting didn't matter. So position independence and accuracy in the home environment so outside of the lab. And they were able to validate this to show that it was relevant. They used a large number of data points um, over two to three years monitoring dogs in experimental and clinical settings, essentially to validate that it was detecting itch appropriately and they could monitor it. Um, and the value of this is its objective data. We have seen in various cases where a lot of the times in certain situations we're using um, what we kind of call the, the kind of owner observations scoring. So um, sort of visual analog scoring that the owner's doing. Um, and that's quite objective to the owner. 
whereas these devices provide a much more subjective way of measuring it. And we've seen this numerous numerous times from um, assessors in submissions is, you know, how objective is that measure? And it comes up as a question. They're looking for more objective ways to measure data. And these devices, it's big data because they're monitoring in the background. One thing they can do is provide real-time alerts to the pet owners that the dog's scratchy or more scratchy, that it might need to see the vet or need another dose. Um, but if you think about it in a clinical trial context or real-world data, they're continuously monitoring hundreds of thousands, millions of data points. We also looked to understand whether it was as good as the tr traditional PVAS, the visual analog score. Um, core message with this was it was as good as it tracked very well with it. So it was giving us the same information as the traditional type of scoring did. Um, I won't go into the detail here, but if you think about it, pet owners can tell something's bad or not bad, but they don't really have much accuracy in the middle. <laughs> so um, it's actually really critical for intervention and early detection, but also then how that translates to our ability to use it in terms of measuring the efficacy of a therapeutic. Um, this ultimately showed us that we could use the data to indicate that these um, itch trackers, should we call them, could alert the pet owner when the dog needed to visit the vet. Um, it ended up increasing vet visits um, and providing basically better health for the dogs. Um, there was about 40% of dogs were predisposed to itch or um, paritis, but weren't undiagnosed. So, you know, that's really useful in that sense, but it's also potentially massively powerful in terms of demonstrating medicine's efficacy. And my final example is one I actually pulled up having been to the EPAA um, annual conference, and it's a three hours one. And this one goes more to actually a general data sharing and the value of data sharing in terms of potential three hours. And it's the idea of potentially using historical data from control groups to establish a virtual control group. So similar to an external control arm in a clinical trial, um, it was mentioned in the context of human health starting to look at this in toxicological, can't say that, sorry, toxicological studies um, and trying to be able to reduce the number of animals or any animals they need in control groups using historical information. Um, it's, so it's sharing legacy data from in vivo tox studies um, to analyze the variability of the control group. So historical animal data, potentially right now, the amount of data being shared is relatively small, but if you can imagine the more data you've got have from historical control studies in say beagles or Wistar rats, whatever it is, you're building a much better database of understanding the general variability of a control group, which means that you can potentially reduce the amount of animals you need to use. Um, you know, quoted from the publication I've referenced here, the potentially reducing up to 25% reduction in control animal use and randomized data sets. Prerequisites for doing this, obviously, availability of large, well-structured control data sets, as well as thorough statistical evaluations, but also that sharing of data. And that is clearly going to be an important factor in certain areas of our ability to do that, is willingness of both industry, the regulators. Um, and also, this is a potential space for cross-sectorial collaboration if you think about chemicals data and control groups etc so i wanted to bring this one in at the end as a nice example of the real potential of um big data and data sharing to generate large data sets that give you the opportunity to make real strides not just in innovation but also in three r's and finally um some conclusions um i think the big thing to say from our side is there's big potential in big data um Data sources and the use of data in veterinary medicine are very varied and variable, though. You know, we don't have anything like Darwin so far, and I think we're a long way from having something like that. But all of it has the power to enhance and improve regulator decision making, but also our abilities industry to accelerate innovation in medicines. Benefits exist for innovation in both new medicines, but also in how we understand and enhance existing medicines. If you think about additional indications, um, in some cases, if we have to deal with pharmacovigilance issues um, and the environmental aspects were touched on, but also in new indications, understanding their use more and, and defending their benefit risk profile. And experience and guidance from human health gives us a place to start, but it needs to be balanced against the veterinary context. But at the same time, I think it, it absolutely does give us a great place to start. We're not starting from nothing here in veterinary medicine, and we're certainly very much looking very closely at what's happening in human health. 
And real world evidence and data can potentially become a more powerful approach to support veterinary medicines, given the breadth and complexity of both our patient populations and our context of use. And I think that final point, context of use, is one of the most critical things that we are starting to understand as we explore this further is understanding the data, but also context of use and the way in which we can use it, because it's completely different to our traditional data sources. And understanding that both from an industry side and from a regulator side will be critical in our ability to move it forward. But I hope very much we're at the start of the journey. And that's all I have for you. Which is a pretty amazing and um, especially if you consider um, I have heard you talk two years ago and um, so um, when we talked about the work plan and development um, I think it's also amazing what the industry is doing and um, how much you're developing and um, how much more we are getting from there so thanks Emil for this talk um, and now we will go over, uh, go to the next speaker which is Dario Piselli. Uh, we already have heard him um, as, a, uh, as answering the question from before. So um, he is giving us the cross-agency cooperation view um, as he is um, working for the European Environmental Agency. Um, he, is an, he is an expert in environment, health and well-being at EEA in, in Copenhagen. So um, he works on issues relating to the interface between food systems, environment and human health. Um, as a background, he holds a PhD at International Law and a Master of Science in Environment and Development. And in addition to his uh, work there, he already has held uh, research positions at the Center for International Environmental Studies and the Global Health Center at the uh, Graduate Institute at Geneva. Thanks, Emil. Um, Dario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I, I hope, can, uh, hope you can hear me. Um... So I know that Katarina should have my slides. Uh, so I'm waiting for her to share them. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, so as you as you rightly said, uh, I'm I'm going to give a little bit of a of a different uh, perspective here, coming from uh, from another sector, really. Um, but at the same time, of course, I will emphasize the the, the potential for uh, for big data driven collaboration uh, among uh, our agencies, among not only the EMA and the EA, but uh, I would say all the EU agencies working on issues related to environment, public health, and uh, and food safety. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a little bit of a background on uh, our role uh, in this space. Uh, next slide. Um, as for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with the European Environment Agency, we are one of the agencies of the European Union, one of the five uh, MV agencies. So the agency is really under the remit of the European Parliament's Committee on Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, together with EMA, but also together with the European Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, the European Chemicals Agency and the European Food Safety uh, Authority. Uh, our mandate compared with uh, EMA uh, and uh, ECA and EFSA, for example, is less of a regulatory uh, science mandate, if you will. Uh, we are more of an environmental monitoring and a scientific advice, scientific assessment uh, agency. Uh, so, of course, even there, I would say our use of, of data and our perspective on the use of data is a little bit different. Um, so I, I hope that this will be kind of an interesting uh, spin on, uh, on the topic today. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and of course, we work on uh, uh, traditionally on a, on a lot of different work areas that support the implementation of the European Green Deal and that are traditionally associated with, with the realm of, of the environment, biodiversity, climate change, uh, circular economy and resource to sustainability transitions more broadly. But of course, human health and the environment is a big topic for us and, and a growing one. It emerged uh, in our case because we are under European legislation, one of the, the agency that uh, works with the uh, monitoring of uh, air pollution and, and air quality, for example. And then we expanded from there on chemicals, on uh, uh, on other aspects, on noise and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I guess this is it's here that our perspective has become increasing increasingly a One Health uh, perspective over the years, really linking the environmental health dimension with human health and with, uh, with animal health. And this is where, this is the domain where we're really trying to, uh, to develop our, our capacity and our skills and our assessment more and more. Next slide. 
Uh, and we're doing that, of course, because One Health, the, the notion of One Health that as, uh, I guess, uh, you know, experts and practitioners coming from the veterinarian sector, you probably have, um, you know, you're quite familiar with it. But I think compared with uh, the notion as it was in its emergence, it's really uh, it's really expanded over the years. It gives greater attention to the role of the environment, uh, to ecosystem uh, health factors. Uh, it brings a lot of effort. It brings a lot of emphasis on the need for collaboration across disciplines and across sectors. And it really ex expanded also from a focus on infectious and re-emerging zoonotic and re-emerging infectious diseases to also include uh, non-communicable diseases. So this is really where the environment becomes more and more relevant. Um, next slide. Um, and it becomes more relevant precisely because, of course, environmental stressors, whether it's uh, contaminants or processes such as land use change, climate change, biodiversity loss, affect, of course, at the role of the environment as a reservoir of pathogen and, and, and harmful substances affects processes taking place into the environment and ultimately act as a mediator of, of, of health outcomes, uh, ranging from, of course, uh, outcomes in terms of those driven by uh, the quality of the air, of the food that we eat, but also zoonotic spillovers, uh, untreatable infections with, with uh, AMR and, and so on and so forth. Next slide. I think here there's gonna be, sorry, there were a few clicks that I forgot to, to emphasize more and more. There you go, next slide. Um, and and so we are really trying to apply as the EA, uh, you know, the, the One Health lens to the work that we're doing, but also to the work that we're going to do. We are moving, I guess, into this perspective more and more. Uh, at the moment, we're working a lot on issues related to environmental health risks, as I mentioned, uh, air quality, noise, water quality, and so on. We uh, all the monitoring, let's say, of in, the, in the context of zero pollution action plan and then linkages between climate change and health. Uh, but in the future, we're going to work more and more on other aspects. So emphasizing, for example, the health benefits of nature conservation and restoration, nature-based solutions, uh, looking at, at the interfaces between different geospatial dimensions and human health, different factors of the environment surrounding us and human health. And antimicrobial resistance for our represents a big topic with antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Uh, next slide. Um, so of course, a lot of the work that we do, both what we are doing right now uh, and what we are going to do more from the perspective of One Health relies on uh, on data, uh, and it will increasingly rely on the integration of different data sets and on the use of, of big data and, uh, and uh, new technologies. So of course, we are also dealing with the same questions that uh, Emma is, uh, is dealing with. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have it in our strategy, uh, the EA Ionet strategy to 2030 uh, as one of the main strategic objectives, the one of making full use of the potential of data, technology, and digitalization. Next slide. And, uh, and we are articulating based on that priority, uh, a data management strategy that has different strategic priority areas and they really cover a bit the full spectrum of, of some of the things that also have been discussed uh, previously. For us, it's really important. Um, I want to just emphasize a couple of things, which is the e-reporting, so strengthening really the, the, our infrastructure for the data flows that we already deal with, some of which are relevant from the perspective, of course, of, uh, of some of the things that, that we have been discussing. For example, the EA is the agency collecting the data relating to contaminants in, in water under the Water Framework Directive in Europe. Uh, and our information system for the uh, the so-called water information system for Europe is one of the one of the pillars of that. Um, the, our work on uh, on Copernicus, so on satellite data, uh, we in house we manage one of the Copernicus services, the one relating to land use, uh, land monitoring, and and in situ service. But of course, we also work with all the other Copernicus uh, data, the atmosphere air quality, and so on. And then, of course, the aspect relating to data partnerships and the need to. Uh, expand our collaboration on data together with uh, other ecosystems and other actors. Uh, next slide. And just to give you a few examples, um, the, Copernicus, the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service is one of the six Copernicus services that has a lot of products 
uh, organizing different components, uh, as I as you know, some of which I mentioned, the uh, ones relating to land cover and land use, priority area monitoring. So, for example, monitoring coastal areas, uh, Natura 2000 protected areas, and uh, and so on and so forth. And one of the challenges for us, next slide, is to how to deal with this increased increasing amount of data of of big data effectively, because when we're talking about satellite based. Um, systems, of course, we're talking about big data also, not just in terms of challenges related to integration of data, but also the size uh, of this data. And uh, and on top of these issues related to, to, to uh, the amount of data that uh, we have to deal with, there's the issues related to, of course, the, the ensuring that the data that we have in-house really uh, responds to fair principles, making sure that this data is discoverable and, and, and findable, and then uh, that users know how to access it, how to exploit it, and uh, and also making sure that our data responds to the to requirements for interoperability and reusability, which is also really the you know the baseline for then collaborating with uh, other uh, stakeholders. Next slide. And as part of that, as part of the strategy, we are trying to develop over the next few years so the called Copernicus Land Data Store, which one of the main um, objectives there is precisely to ensure interoperability with other clouds and systems and to uh, and to really have to really adapt to the new reality of increasing amount of data that we're dealing with in house uh, with through a new framework for data governance. Next slide. Another example is how we are dealing with um, where how we are, I would say, going from the big data that we have or that we have access to, to information, to our assessments. And one of the examples here relates to air pollution. Uh, this is probably one of the, the first, er first areas where we are really making big strides because um, we are uh, using uh, the big data that comes from uh, Copernicus services, atmospheric monitoring service, land monitoring service, together with the air quality data reported from uh, the member states, uh, and then analyzing that together with data on um, uh, popula population, basically data, to make sure that we can provide a health risk assessment for, uh, for Europeans. So arrive at um, assessing, of course, the health impacts every year um, on uh, the deriving from air pollution. Next slide. And, and in this, machine learning is also helping us because we're trying to apply it, for example, to uh, automated data collection, make sure that um, these services that we are that we can use essentially uh, automated uh, data collection collection and generating the necessary data sets for uh, machine learning productions. Next slide, but also to um, produce the maps and to fill gaps uh, where we don't have, for example, data from monitoring stations. Next slide. So going to uh, a bit more, I would say the forward looking part and how this relates to our work uh, across agencies. Uh, first of all, I think it's worth to emphasize that uh, the EA together with them and together with the other agencies is really um, um, trying to step up collaboration on topics at the interface of human, animal, and, and environmental health, which is, of course, what unites us. Next slide. And we're doing so uh, through uh, an interagency task force on One Health. Uh, we're currently, um, we have started working already for several months. We are uh, currently developing an action plan for the next few years. We have recently published an interagency statement to support the One Health agenda in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and we have identified a few strategic priorities. Next slide. Um, and if you if you click, um, yes, uh, you can you can see I guess that some of these priority areas of work for the task force really relate to uh, making better use of the data that we have and sharing those data, um, and and also pointing to data gaps that can be filled by other stakeholders, right? In uh, uh, and in better interacting with the research ecosystem with uh, uh, other stakeholders across the veterinary, environmental, and human health sector to to see what the knowledge gaps are. So of course, data I would say is one of the cross cutting topics uh, under uh, the, the 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 priorities of of the task force. Uh, next slide. And uh, and if you look at what 
uh, are already existing One Health collaborations between EU agencies, either between the five agencies or between some of them, uh, whether it's collaboration on emerging risks uh, and impacts, whether it's the uh, recent serious cross-border threats to health regulation, which requires uh, joint rapid risk assessments from uh, from EU agencies, uh, whether it's about the chemical uh, legislation or environmental risk assessment, we are already, um, these collaborations are already critically premised on making sure that we share data with each other, we improve data integration, and we um, try to leverage also the possibilities offered by, by, uh, by big data. Next slide. And here it's where I wanted to offer a few um, thoughts, I would say, on, on the future. And this is what builds a little bit on uh, what, uh, what Ivo was saying earlier, that is that there are, I think, a lot of opportunities that uh, for collaborations that we haven't yet harnessed. The, the big issue here is that either on the one side, we don't necessarily have the environmental uh, monitoring data that can complement the data, for example, collected across the veterinary and human health sector, or vice versa. Uh, somehow the EU-wide health data is not necessarily available for certain purposes, um, and, uh, or where, when there is already uh, data, there may be issues related to what we were saying earlier. So issues related to the discoverability, the interoperability, the reusability of this data. And these are just some ideas of areas where really veterinary data and then human health data and, uh, and environmental data can really make a difference. We were discussing, of course, of antimicrobial resistance as one of the priorities for in the context of uh, Emma's veterinary big data strategy. In our case, um, we have just some data in, in the context of our, um, basically our envir environmental monitoring under the water framework uh, directive about pharmaceuticals in European waters. And we don't have a lot of data because uh, until now, and to this date, actually, there's no legislative requirements for member states to report data, for example, of on antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance genes in European waters. This is a proposal under the water framework, the revision of the water framework uh, legislation uh, that has not been adopted yet. And of course, with this data, uh, it would be, we would have a lot of opportunities to better integrate that with antimicrobial use data, for example, and data relating also to not only to the veterinary sector, but also coming from, from, the, from the human health and the public health sector to have a better picture of hot, hot spots of dynamics of antimicrobial resistance uh, and, uh, and how, of course, and the effects also of policies to reduce antimicrobial uh, use, uh, including in the veterinary sector. Um, same thing with environmental risk assessment. I think here there's a lot of opportunities to use environmental data to support the identification of potential hazards and risks. Uh, here as well, the issue sometimes is the availability of this data because not necessarily uh, the data that is relevant for the regulatory um, uh, science process is available uh, and, uh, and uh, or in some cases, maybe here we can do better work at sharing uh, the data that already exists. Um, one thing that the European Environment Agency has been tasked with in recent years is to uh, be a bit the hub uh, in the European context for human biomonitoring data, uh, so expo human exposure to um, different chemicals and contaminants. This could be, for example, useful in the future. Uh, we are really not yet there, but it would be useful to do exposure assessments that really took into account not just um, uh, data coming more from the experimental uh, side, but also observational data and, and, uh, and again, data about actual human exposure. Um, we, you know, this is another example in the context of uh, conducting assessments on the influence of geospatial factors on health. Here on this side, we have environmental data, we have satellite data, but we do not necessarily have EU-wide health data because of course, as, as you know, there are issues related to, to that. Um, and this would allow also joint uh, assessments. Finally, this is more of a, of a matter of really developing um, use cases um, also between um, agencies, I would say, uh, there's a lot of possibility to use environmental data, for example, satellite-based uh, Copernicus data to support epidemiological studies of animal diseases. We, to a certain extent, we're doing that uh, with respect to human health when we uh, look into um, the um, 
changes in the distribution or potential exposure to uh, certain vectors of, of disease based on the evolution of climatic and environmental factors. I know that the research community works, uses Copernicus data often for this epidemiological study of animal diseases as well. Uh, but I think maybe there's opportunities there for further collaboration across the agencies as well. Um, these are just some examples. And again, these are not really ready-made use cases because there are data gaps. There are gaps in terms of our collaboration, but I think these are just some ideas that based on some of the priorities that have been discussed in the context of Emma's veterinary data strategies and based also on the more general priorities of, of the One Health agenda in Europe, we could pursue uh, in uh, in the future. Uh, with this, I think I'm, uh, I'm done. I yield the floor, of course, happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you, Dario. Um, and yeah, thank you for this um, interesting talk and um, to see those parallels um, that you identified and also uh, the opportunities uh, that might be there for collaboration um, between uh, EMA and um, your agency. Um, as you said, uh, I'm pretty sure there are questions. However, we will have um, the Q&A at the end of the session. So um, after all three speakers have given their talks. Um, but before that, um, we will have a short coffee break. <laughs> so. Um, we will see each other again in around 50 minutes, so five past three. And then we will hear um, the last talk from the Swiss Medic Agency. Thanks, Emil. OK, then welcome back after the coffee break um, to the last speaker to the session. Um, however, as I told you, we will have the question and answer at the end of the session. Nevertheless, if you have questions now, please feel free to um, put them into the chat so um, the speakers can already prepare for the answers. Um, else, um, now I may um, introduce the last speaker of the session. Um, that is uh, my, uh, Michael Renaudin. Renaudin, sorry, my French, Renaud. Something, yeah. Um, he is um, uh, from Swiss Medic. Uh, he's uh, by training an ethnologist and socialist. And he is the head of Swiss Medic 4.0. Um, this is an independent and agile organizational unit of the Swiss uh, National Competent Authority and that is concerned with the challenges and opportunities of digital transformation. Um, he, is, he and his team are developing solutions and applications in the field of AI, of machine learning, and also including applications of large language models. And um, also he is creating training programs and information material. Uh, Michael, the stage is yours. Well, thank, thank you very much um, for the presentation. And well, you already said it all. Um, that's what we do. So I'm representing Swiss Medic 4.0, which is Swiss Medic's uh, innovation lab. And I will talk about uh, a few projects we already realized, um, telling you like in the beginning that most of them are still in, in like a, an MVP status. So not all of them are productive yet. Um, to, to start with, I would like to talk about Swiss Medic 4.0. So like three years ago at Swiss Medic, we realized that the world is turning fast and our uh, stakeholders are investing a lot in modern technology, um, such as machine learning, artificial intelligence. We know there's something happening like a digital transformation. And although Swiss Medic is and was at this time already digitized, meaning that we were using uh, modern technology in order to, to um, do whatever we did. Um, we, we were, um, well, we, we were talking about what, what could we do in order to, to, to keep track, in order to, to, um, know what's happening around us. And, uh, also in order to understand what our stakeholders are doing. And that was the reason why we started with Swiss Medic 4.0 as an innovation lab. So, um, having Swiss Medic as, as a tank ship, as, as a cargo ship uh, floating on, on the ocean, the idea was to develop a, a small speedboat in order to find out um, well, what, what could we do and, and how could we like integrate new digital business model or how could we change the way we are working or we are collaborating internally and externally. Um, today, Swiss Medic 4.0 has uh, four uh, seven team members. Um, some of them are uh, data scientists, others are computational specialists, and we do also have um, specialists in the field of innovation and, and collaboration. We do have a date of expiry um, in, in about two years time, it's going to be over. And uh, well, 
our vice uh, management board will then decide what's going to happen with us or uh, if, if, if there's going to be maybe a Swiss Medic 4.1 or 5.0. We don't know yet, so we'll see what's going to happen. Um, I will talk about technology later on. I will talk about four different projects we already realized, but um, to be honest, um, to, to really explain what, what Swiss Medic 4.0 is, um, I, I well like to talk about three dimensions which are important uh, for our initiative. And I would like to start with the most important dimension, which is the bubble uh, on, at 12 o'clock, the, the human uh, or cultural bubble. Um, Digital transformation means not only that we apply new technologies, we, we, we start doing uh, artificial intelligence. Digital transformation means also that we, we have to think about the way we are working together. We have to think about, um, well, uh, m new new trends, new, new frameworks. And, and therefore, we, we do believe that we, we have to take our colleagues at Swiss Medic with us. So we have to show and, and tell them what's happening uh, to the left and to the right. And therefore, we, uh, from the first day on, we started um, organizing work, workshops, uh, explaining what, what is digital transformation, what, what is artificial intelligence, what can you do with it? So what has, are the boundaries, the, the risks, but also the chances. And uh, we, we organized a lot uh, in courses and, and training. We organized courses on machine learning on programming um, to 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 well to to, to um, get in touch with our colleagues. Um, we, we provided lots of e-learnings. We produced videos in order to explain and, and have interactions with our colleagues. And uh, we still organize a lot of live updates. So a live update is uh, like um, we, we invite people from, from um, the universities or, or from our uh, other stakeholders um, to, to come to Swiss Medic and, and tell us what, what they are doing in the field of the digital transformation. Um, and if, you, if you go to the left, um, eight o'clock uh, around this is organization and processes. And we, we, we do believe that's also very, very important. Um, we have a lot of uh, collaborations with university, also with other agencies. Um, we're doing a lot with the Global Coalition on Regulatory Science Research, and we invest a lot in Agile Framework. So from the first day on, we started uh, realizing our project with, with Scrum. Um, which is, um, as I said, an agile framework, but it, it also changes the way people understand per, um, projects, meaning that we didn't realize a single project without having um, some expert at Swiss Medic um, being the product owner. So we said, OK, we, we're going to realize something with you, but we want to have you on board from the first day on. And that iterative approach um, that helped us a lot in, in order to transfer knowledge uh, from, from one side to the other. And we also learned a lot from our experts. Uh, one main um, keyword or one, one main thing about Swiss Medic 4.0 was to fail fast. So we um, developed a lot of solutions, but some of them failed and, and we, we quit fast and, and tried to identify a, a new opportunity, which is also quite a, a new approach in, in, in a regulatory authority. And then finally, to the, the point you are waiting for, well, um, the dot at four o'clock technology. And um, I will in a few seconds talk about four different projects. But, but first of all, um, Basically, we wanted to develop proof of concept or we said, well, if there's a proof of concept, we might maybe push forward and, and start building a prototype. But the thing is, we um, well, we all fell in love with our solutions and most of our solutions are, are past prototypes. So uh, some of them are in the state of uh, minimal valuable products, MVPs, and some of them could even uh, be set into production. But I will talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Um, to give you a few, my keyboard uh, keyboard is not responding. All good. So um, I would like to present you for for initiative we started. Um, I will start uh, with the oldest one, Medicrawl, and then uh, talk about Lisa Trisha and ask your documents, which is our 
most recent uh, project. Um, you, you see those diff uh, four different solutions we so far uh, we produced um, uh, as examples, and you see where um, we see uh, potential um, internally at Swiss Medic. So, uh, for example, LISA is uh, used at our uh, authorization uh, sector or and licensing sector, and uh, Medicra, for example, is used in the market surveillance sector. And I will start uh, um, telling you a little bit about Medicrawl. Um, Medicrawl is an application that crawls e-commerce websites, and we're basically looking for illegal products um, according to Swiss regulations. So we are looking for counterfeit products, um, products that uh, are not allowed to be sold uh, online. And basically, we are crawling through uh, markets like eBay or Ricardo, but it could also be other uh, forums or websites. Um, the, the positive point is we have lots of data. We had, have lots of data, historic collected products, so we know a lot what um, is, is, is sold in Swiss marketplaces and we know about, uh, well, basically we know which products might be sold uh, online uh, illegally, so that helped us um, build a classification model in order to um, well, uh, decide whether uh, an identified product is, is relevant or not. So what Medicrawl does, it, it crawls products in online market and then does a certain filtering, meaning that we're focusing only on Swiss pr uh, products and Swiss marketplace. And then uh, Medicrawl is delivering, uh, delivering a scoring of the found product. Uh, for, for example, if, if you sell uh, like a chlamydia test, it's, it's, it's illegal. So it, it's of, of high interest for Medicrawl. If there's a, a, a T-shirt with the chlamydia on it, uh, well, of of course, it, it, it will be identified by Medicrawl, but it's, it's, it's never relevant. So after the filtering and the scoring, there's a relevance classification taking part. And then our uh, experts, they will evaluate what's, what Medicrawl has been discover, discovered. And we have integrated the feedback system as well, meaning that the experts will then um, tell Medicrawl whether the, um, the, the, the scoring has been useful, whether the identity identified product has is of interest or not and that um, constant feedback loops helps us a lot uh, in order to 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 make our classification model better and medicrawl become a, a, a better solution um, medicrawl is in use right now um, in our market surveillance um, um, department um, you see here um, uh, an, an example. So the, those were the, the products Medic, uh, Me Medicrawl uh, identified and product by product, our experts can then uh, either bookmark uh, um, a product if it's interesting. Um, they can uh, inform Medicrawl, yes, um, um, a surveillance in, is in pro uh, progress or the experts can then decide, well, it's not relevant or it, it will be never relevant. And uh, Doing that, they train the model. And what's also quite interesting is that the results you see right now, they can easily transfer uh, in, into the, the document pipeline of Swissmedic, and they can um, even start an image search. So, for example, you see that fat burn extreme. Once they identified a certain image, they can uh, make an image search online, which is quite useful. So you can uh, crawl the, the web for identical pictures. Um, another maybe interesting project for you is, is LISA, and LISA helps us to defect, uh, sa um, sa detect safety signals in unstructured test text. Um, it started with the clinical trials department. Um, while well, doing their work, they were highly dependent on sponsored documents um, to, in order to um, get to know an active substance or, or in, in order to find out about um, safety signals. They had uh, to do a time-consuming search for relevant literature on PubMed and, and other sources. And um, well, some two years ago, there was no passive monitoring of, of safety signals. So it was just on purpose we identified uh, safety signals signals and, and sometimes, well, we weren't sure if we identified them all. And well, of course, there was limited knowledge sharing because there was no, no um, like common platform where, um, existing. 
And the vision then was to start with an automatic search. So we wanted to um, build an AI-based search for, for, for concepts. And we wanted to integrate various literature sources, for example, as I said before, PubMed, but also the EMA and FDA websites, since those websites uh, provide lots of interesting information, Swiss Medic. Um, we wanted to, to uh, deliver relevant results for our experts and um, we wanted to have like an AI-based relevance determination on, of safety signals. So we wanted to know whether a safety signal is serious and, and relevant. And again, we were interested in creating a feedback loop so, so the machine is able to learn. Um, and of course, then some, some, some knowledge management processes. So processing the results into Excel and PDFs and other, other uh, data uh, formats. Um, that's how um, Liza looks today. Welcome back, to Alexander. Alexander is uh, a colleague uh, working for Swissmatic 4.0. It's been his, it's, it's his baby. He, he was uh, developing uh, Liza together with the expert. And you see that you can define easily a new query. Um, you can easy, um, either enter a product name or an active substance or an indication. And um, below you see the, the query. So Alex started so far 18 queries and um, you see what, what happened since uh, he was looking for, for example, opera, whatever that is. Um, um, it, it uh, identified six new uh, substances in, in, in the last, or six new articles in the last month. Um, to give you insight, um, that's that's a print screen of, of the dashboard you were ha uh, you have at, at Liza. So um, there was another product research, and you see um, on on the left hand side, you see um, in which year a certain publication was was published. You see um, the article source. So we ha found our articles on the EMA website, but also on PubMed. And on the right hand side, you see those 48 articles that have been uh, discovered by Liza. Um, again, we have implemented feedback loops, so the experts are um, able to tell Liza whether an article is not relevant, it is relevant, um, and then can move on with their work. Liza does not all, um, only deliver an article, but it does also highlight um, symptoms and active substances, and it does deliver uh, a summary of the article so that our experts can quickly decide whether a certain publication is uh, interesting or not. Um, you see the sources we are crawling right now. Um, thank you very much, uh, EMA, but we're also crawling FDA, um, PubMed, TGA, Health Canada, MHRA, and our own sources. Um, it's important to say that all those sources are publicly available. Um, so we are only working with public data uh, for reasons. Um, next one is, is Trisha. Um, Trisha is a risk-based classification of incoming incident reports for our medical device department. Um, our colleagues at uh, medical devices, they, they get around uh, 6,000 to 7,000 uh, incident reports a year. And that's quite a lot of work. And the triage, um, well, it has to be done by, by our experts. Um, we do believe that um, this work be, uh, is comparable to, comparable to a full-time um, um, job. What our experts are doing, so they are reading the incoming messages and then they are calculating a so-called RAT score. The RAT score um, gives us information about the severity, uh, probability of occurrence and uh, discoverability of an incident. And of course, sometimes political relevance is also uh, important. If you remember COVID, for example, well, COVID was uh, well number one priority a few years ago. Um, the vision of Trisha is have like an automated triage. So our machine learning model is able to calculate a RAT score out of unstructured test, uh, text and then deliver the RAT score to our experts. Um, still, our experts are in charge. It's up to them to decide, but, but it helps us to eliminate a lot of noise. Um, for example, if, if a tape 
is not glowing in your skin, it, it might be well annoying, but the rat score is still though would be very, very low because the severity um, is, is quite low um, in this example. Um, how does Trisha work? Um, again, we had lots of uh, historic data we used to train our models. Um, those historic incident uh, reports, we had thousands or tens of thousands of them. They, they helped us to train bird models and they trained the models on severity detection ability and probability and what's now happening is that we receive an incident report we import the, the report to our system and then Trisha is doing the work uh, calculating as um, the rat score and and deciding which risk, risk class the incident report um, is, is is to be put in and then there's um, a validation by expert and again we have that feedback loop installed it's right now working for the medical devices department, but we are sure that what Trisha can be used, for example, at the pharmacovigilance department as well. Last but not least, um, ask your document, uh, which is uh, maybe uh, the most interesting um, pr project because it has something to do with large language models. Um, and um, ask your documents has been created together with um, other agencies uh, so it, it's um it started in collaboration with the La uh, large language model task force we established under the umbrella of the global coalition on regulatory science research um, last year we we came together in uh, the summit in singapore and we, we decided uh, on investing jointly um, together in, in in the field of large language models and we met in june this year in Bern in order to to um, have a workshop together and we spent three days in um, developing a ask your documents as a solution but also b um, we were working on a collective white paper uh, in order to position our agency the, the members were, um, well, colleagues from the FDA, but also from EFSA and, and other agencies all around the world. Ask Your Documents is, uh, well, it, it's, it's like ChatGPT, so it, it has the same, same uh, possibilities, but also the same limitations. Um, what's possible with Ask Your Documents? So you can simply upload a PDF and then um, once Ask Your Documents has understood what's in the PDF, you can ask starting, uh, start asking questions. So as an example, we uploaded a, a public assessment report on Alhimol, and then we are able to, to, to ask questions on the documents. It's, it's like ChatGPT, but the huge advantage of Ask Your Documents, it, it, it can't be deployed locally. So where um, uh, my colleagues at Swiss Medic are not allowed to use um, ChatGPT in, 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 in our uh, office environment because of data security uh, 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 reasons, Ask Your Documents um, well allows it all. Uh, it's running on a, on a locally installed server. It can easily de uh, be deployed in any cloud solution you want. And if you're interested in, in, in that project, the code is available on GitHub. So just go on GitHub and, and help yourself. If you have questions or remarks, uh, we're happy to cooperate. And the good thing about Ask Your Document, as I said before, it has been de developed uh, as an interagency or in an interagency task force. So a lot of international um, brain, uh, brains were involved and that, that helped us a lot. Um, again, so you can upload documents and then um, start querying, asking questions and, and you see the response space. Um, you see also um, you see also the source. So um, Ask Your Documents is telling you where it found the information, which is quite useful in a scientific context. Well, to sum it all up, um, we had a plan and we had now three years time and we were able to develop a, a few prototypes or a few MVPs, but to be honest, um, most of them are not in the productive system yet. So, um, of course, it's it's not easy as a speedboat to influence the whole organization. And and still, though, we have an IT IT department um, that is um, well has has different plans than innovating fast. And but things have changed. 
changed a lot. And, and even at Swiss Medic, uh, even in Switzerland, it's possible to, to start new initiatives. And we will have uh, an existing cloud solution by the beginning of 24. So in the next year, we will be able to transfer our solution in the productive environment, which is going to be, well, very, very important to whatever it uh, developed so far. Um, as a, all, all the experts that were involved in the development will, will be happy to see that their solutions will be uh, productive. Um, we do know that we have a lot of things still to discuss and still have to regulate a lot of things. Um, we, we, for the moment, we don't have any policies on AI, on the uses of AI, to, uh, AI internally, but also on a federal level in Switzerland. And, um, we know that that we have to 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 make a lot of work in order to fully understand what's happening with large language model, and we didn't yet um, deliver uh, um, a very good solution that is might be uh, of in, used in a daily basis at Swiss Medic. So we have still a lot of work. But if you're interested uh, in what we did, if you want to have or uh, an interaction with us to necessitate, we would be happy if you would reach out to us. And that's, that's it from Swiss Medic. Thanks a lot, Michael. And just in time, perfect. I know. <laughs> um, so um, now we have um, about 15 minutes for questions. Um, so please uh, feel free to raise your hand, then we can unmute you, or else um, just type it into the chat box. And in order to just start, this is my, <laughs> my pleasure. Um, Michael, the question goes to you. Um, and I hope. Um, <laughs> Because you said um, we try to fail fast. <laughs> I don't know if we want to be asked that question, but where do you fail? Or where did you fail? Or what did you learn? And um, what could we perhaps learn from your failures? Um, well, lots of questions. But the, the most important question, uh, what did we learn? So we learned that it is important to fail fast. So do not fall in love with your darlings. Do not fall in love with a, a certain um, technology. Um, we did involve our experts and we did involve my colleagues. And, and uh, once you start working on a vision, on a product, well, usually you fall in love with what you do. And it's quite hard to kill it. And, and unfortunately, um, we're regarding a few solutions. We did wait too long to kill them. Okay, so kill them faster. Um, thanks a lot for the answer. Um, are there other questions? Oh, to my left, Ivo, please. You know, I, I've got a first question, uh, basically, uh, uh, to Katrina, uh, and and it's um, you gave you gave a few examples of where you think big data could really be helpful, and one of those examples was three R's, and I'm really interested in that because that's where you said you know if you could combine all the data from those studies, toxicology studies, etc., what good value that could bring. But that brings me to the point which I think is really relevant is data sharing, and and uh, we had the discussion on data sharing also on three R's. I think it must have been four or five years ago when we were developing regulatory science strategy. Um, and we know that the pharmaceutical individual, pharmaceutical industry, innovative industry is sitting on a, a huge heap of data. Uh, and you, I think you can guess where my question is going. Data sharing is essential if you want to do look at big data, if you really want to maximize what can be uh, gotten from big data whether it's in relation to three R's or uh, environmental risk assessment, that sort of stuff. So how do you see that in the future? I, th I don't need to mention all the obstacles. I think we know what all the obstacles are, but how do you see that development? How can we maximize uh, the use of data, uh, particularly for three R's? Because I think that is, a, that is an important area where uh, we can make progress. I think it's gonna depend a lot on the specific areas. Um, I think one observation from being involved with the 3R space for a long time is that they do a better job of sharing data on the human health side. Um, they did a project relatively recently through EPAA, which was around um, safety data for monoclonal antibodies and trying to reduce some of the preclinical stuff in certain species and that sort of thing. And that the way they did share data, they shared data within the human health space. So I think 
we can probably identify certain use cases where we can potentially encourage data sharing. So I think that, that made me think about the um, the control group information. That is potentially a relatively um, no, or pre-competitive or non-competitive space to share data. I think that's where it, it's going to be difficult. It's it's almost more challenging in the veterinary sector than it is in human health to encourage that type of data sharing. And there's going to be some areas that probably will be off limits that companies are just not prepared to work in. I think the three R space and potentially some of the environmental space and understanding that on a molecule basis, so a, a substance basis, are probably two of the areas where it's worth having those conversations with industry. I mean, I, that's just an opinion right now. I, I can't speak for Zoetis or, or industry as a whole, but I think there are areas where we will have to work together to get the most out of it. And I think it will be valuable to try and identify some of those use cases earlier, which is why I gave the three R's example, because I think that is one where it is potentially worth further conversation through the three R's working party and other, and, and collaboratively, you know, with, with ECHA um, in the context of certain species, you know, laboratory species and, and also dogs. I think there is room for further conversation there. Um, as to whether we can share data. I, I think, there, like I say, there'll be certain areas where it's just not going to be viable. But I think probably we all need to think a bit differently about it. And instead of thinking defensively, to think about what the potential values, even defensive value for industry, is in sharing data and helping better understand benefit risk or risk, for example, or moving forward through our space. So that's maybe a challenge back to anybody else from industry online that, you know, it, it's certainly a space that warrants further conversation as to are there particular areas where we could collaborate further. Okay, th thank you for the answer. Um, are there any more questions from the audience so far? Please feel free to raise your hand. Um, else, I will have a question for Dario. Um, because um, there were a lot of um, parallels between what we are doing and what your agency is doing and um, where there is a difference is with a um, big data strategy um, because when you um, showed this, this slide it was saying 2021 to 2030 so um, this is a 10, a 10 year strategy compared to our um, four or five year strategies um, are there any, do you see any advantages in such a long term strategy or are you perhaps losing some flexibility um, or do you know why the strategy was planned for such a long um, duration? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, it gives me an opportunity to clarify. Actually, the, the strategy that goes between 2021 and 2030 is our general EEA IONET uh, strategy. So it's the strategy for the entire agency and their data and digitalization is one of the five strategic priorities. Uh, the data management strategy is something different that has a little bit of a shorter time frame for us as well. I think there the actions goes until 2027 more or less, which I think kind of overlaps with, with your uh, data strategy as well. Uh, but it, within that, of course, there are some actions that are more short term um, and, and uh, for example, uh, you know, improving uh, our existing kind of reporting uh, platforms and also um, really making better use of the data that we already have. Uh, because to give you an example, the Copernicus data, we sit on a treasure trove of data, but it's not always easy to develop use cases, not just externally and to make this data available to external users, but also internally in the house. Uh, for for some of the uh, for some of the thematic kind of programs inside the agency that are that kind of receive this information uh, that's developed in other parts of the house, but it's not always immediately used. Uh, whereas there are things that are a bit more long term, which is a bit, for example, the, the issue with the Copernicus land data store that I mentioned. So this issue of uh, more broadly kind of making our uh, all the all of the big data that we have uh, a bit more accessible and interoperable with uh, other ecosystems uh, and, and, and data providers. So there's a mix of short term and longer term actions, but they mostly, uh, I think they, they, they are on a more short term, like I mean, on a more medium term basis until 2027. But the, the advantage of including data and digitalization as a priority up to 2030, I think is a more general, um, uh, I think it was more of a general kind of strategic consideration for us. We aligned our strategy to 2030 as kind of the end 
goal, let's say, of the European Green Deal as well. Um, because what we wanted to emphasize is that data and digitalization and developing our uh, our uh, capacity there was also essential to support the implementation of uh, policies under the European Green Deal. So we wanted to to grow that work and identify it as a priority in parallel with the implementation of the Green Deal. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I think there was one question that Ivo is going to ask um, instead of Jasper, <laughs> please. Okay. <clears throat> Jasper indeed had a question and he asked me whether I could ask it, but I'm going to package it slightly differently. Uh, so. And he will he will have to deal with that when he uh, when he comes back. Uh, and and the question is for Dario. And uh, because um, there, there, there's a lot of different uh, uh, when you look at the environment specifically, there's a lot of different areas where you could start collecting uh, data, start measuring. Uh, we know, for example, that in sewage water uh, during the COVID pandemic and even still now, it, it, sampling sewage is, is used as one of the ways of of looking at the incidence of COVID in, in, in the population. I know they do the same for polio. Uh, sewage water is being collected also at, uh, at, at hospitals to look at uh, uh, excretion in the environment of cancer drugs, uh, hormones, etc. Also, I'm aware of a, a Swedish, uh, or no, a Danish, I think, program looking at surface water to look for uh, antimicrobial resistance in different forms, could be bacteria, could be presence of genes. So, so monitoring surface water. I know that the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, we've had uh, surface water monitoring for medicinal products already for a long time, but it may have changed over the time. So there's a, there's a huge amount of data probably out there uh, that could be used in, 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 uh, and, and could be integrated with, for example, uh, data that we have on the actual use of uh, veterinary and human uh, medicinal products and data that EFSA is having on the use of uh, herbicides and, and, and fungicides and, and other um, biocides. Uh, having said all that, what is uh, EEA currently doing in, in looking at the data landscape from which they could collect the data? And is part of that platform that you mentioned on One Health is part of that also looking at how we can use big data uh, and integrate data and uh, uh, turn that into a benefit for the not only the individual agencies, but also in relation to One Health. So long, complicated question, but I'm sure you've got a simple answer to that, Dario. <laughs> Thanks, Ivo. Uh, no, I mean, in relation to the second part of, of the question, I, I absolutely think that the task force can play a, a big role in this, as, as I mentioned, no, the, a lot, both both the existing collaborations and the discussions that we're having inside the task force on future collaborations really have a lot. Most of them have something to do with issues related to data sharing and to, to big data uh, driven uh, collaborations, I would argue. And and one thing that we're trying to do with the task force is really to not to act as a little group of a few people um, talking about some priorities, but to really connect internally with the colleagues in, in inside the respective agencies that are working on these projects so that then we it's not only the, the five or ten of us that are in the task force that are connecting with each other but then it's the respective experts that are then connecting across the different agencies and um i think we we have some hooks already um uh, for example, there was this uh, mandate, this joint mandate that was recently assigned to all of the agencies on uh, on um, the monitoring of uh, of resistance to uh, to azole fungicides, where there is this collaboration that really cuts across the agencies, and that's that's where, for example, the uh, you know I think having some of these pilot projects where we're really already working together to 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 share data. Uh, and to and to develop assessments together is uh, shows the value, and I think we need to identify more of these projects across uh, the agencies. With respect to to the first question, uh, so as I, as I mentioned a little bit in my presentation, sometimes one of the problems for us is that um, the the reporting obligations that countries have under uh, relevant EU legislation do not necessarily cover. Um, all of the substances that we would like them to cover. So, and one of the issues was, for example, as I, as I said, antimicrobials and uh, um, and antimicrobial resistance genes. Uh, 
That said, we are already working with the countries because we have this IONET, uh, which is basically our country network. So we even before legislative requirements to monitor for antimicrobials come into place, we're already trying to work with the representative of the countries to develop some common reporting uh, method monitoring and reporting methodology so that we are not uh, unprepared when those requirements come into come into place. Um, now what we what we do have now uh, I think is as part of the water framework directive uh, reporting there are a few pharmaceuticals in there that countries sometimes monitor for in their uh, surface water or, or, or groundwater um, one of the issues there is that it's not necessarily easy based only on that reporting to identify um, which of these come from veterinary uses and, and, and human health uses for example so that's one challenge that we we have to work more with the countries uh, on to to understand better the sources and, and and drivers, for example, of the use and why some of these substances end up in uh, in European waters. Uh, but again, to, it's a bit limit linked to the limitations of of the of the reporting obligations as they are. But we're trying to fill them with basically capacity building together with the countries. Thank you for this answer. Um, and that said, we are. Um, Absolutely in time, if there are no more questions from the audience. As I don't see any hands raised, um, I can now hand over to Jana Szalanski, um, who will moderate the last session of today. Um, she is the head of, veterinary, of the Veterinary Strategic Support Office here at EMA. Her background is in business administration and psychology. And she joined uh, the EMA in 2003, um, still in London. And uh, since uh, 2016, she held uh, the program manager position for the veterinary change program that was mostly working on the implementation of the VMP regulation. Um, nowadays, as head of the St veterinary strategic support office, um, she provides um, strategic advice to all levels of the divisions management and currently, especially with a focus on the implementation of the new VEC regulation. Um, Jana, the session is yours. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this uh, session three, then, after these very interesting uh, few hours we've had together already, um, is an open discussion, uh, a panel discussion with um, some one colleague you've seen already speak today and, and two new ones to give some perspective um, on uh, the topics uh, discussed today. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to introduce uh, for sure the panel to you um, and then we are going to uh, reflect together a little bit with uh, Thomas online um, and then uh, Kat and uh, Jocke here in the in the room. So I'll start a quick introduction um, online. We have uh, Professor Dr. Thomas Heberer. Uh, of the HMA management group, but uh, that's not the only function he has. He is a um, head of department at the Federal Office of Consumer Protection and Food Safety, so the BVL, in uh, Germany since 2010. Um, his career so far also included work on environmental research um, at university. He was a head of section residues of medicinal products at the um, Federal Institute for Risk Assessment and head of the Food Institute Oldenburg of Lower Saxony State Office for Consumer Protection and Food Safety. Um, uh, Thomas uh, is also teaching toxicology and modern instrumental analysis as an adjunct professor at the Technical University of Berlin. And in 2004, he received the research award from the German Chemical Society for his pioneering research on the occurrence and fate of pharmaceutical residues in the environment. So that's um, online, uh, Dr. Thomas Heberer for you. And then in the room here on the panel as well, we have uh, Dr. Katrina Serling. And I think she was introduced earlier, so I'm not going to uh, repeat uh, everything that was said back then. Uh, so we have her back again as the industry perspective on this panel. 
And then last but not least, um, we have uh, Dr. Jocke van Hout um, from Gere Animal Health. Um, so Jocke studied uh, veterinary medicine at the University of Utrecht. Um, at this university, she also got her PhD in veterinary medicine. Her fields of interest um, include pharmacology and pharmacotherapy with emphasis on antimicrobial drugs, antimicrobial resistance and infectious bacterial disease and currently um, works as a veterinarian in the pig health um, of uh, Gede Animal Health. Um, so that's the uh, veterinarian, the veterinary healthcare practitioner perspective um, on this panel. So after everything we've heard, um, we wanted to um, have a look towards the future and um, also acknowledge the challenges and barriers um, that still would need to be addressed. And I think a few of those came up already today. Um, so, so challenges and barriers as well that are um, or maybe preventing uh, stakeholders to implement digital technologies either themselves uh, to support animal or public health in the veterinary domain um, or also, for example, on exchanging data. Um, so in that uh, context, um, I think we are going to go around the table to start off the discussion um, and I will uh, pass it first um, actually to, to Katrina because we already, uh, because we had already uh, touched on a few actually in the last question that uh, uh, Ivo posed to you um, in the previous session. So let's start with Kat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and, and I guess I kind of, I touched on this a little bit in, in the presentation. And I mean, I don't think, we don't have any, I don't think we have any legal barriers to doing anything. Um, we don't have any guidance, um, but I don't think we necessarily want any guidance of this space at this point. I think it's way too early for that. Um, I mean, and the, but there is a reasonable amount of information and guidance coming out through the human health domain in terms of, um, there was talk earlier about real world evidence. Um, there's guidance around metadata. Um, commu com I can't say that again, sorry. Computerized um, data collection systems and that sort of thing in a, in a GXP context. So there's a lot of information out there that can help industry. I think one of the biggest challenges we've got is our level of confidence in the acceptability of using data like that. You know, what's whether the regulators will accept that. So I think one of the areas that will be important and it was touched on is that kind of um, training and education, um, understanding across both industry and the network what's possible and I can say just for myself that the more you start to understand this space the more you realize what you don't know or don't understand it. it you know it takes a long time even as an industry regulator to try and understand this and you have to do that before you can then communicate with the agency regulators and Knowing that myself, you know, people are not experts in every area. And I think one of the challenges we will have is that for success in using this to support innovation, it's going to require a bit of a shift of mindset of assessors and, and different skill sets, you know, to going from people who understand um, the veterinary clinical side of things, but also needing that data science experience and expertise to understand um, the value of the data, because I think one of the things you see in, in across the board with new technologies and new approaches is to trust and use or have confidence that that data answers your question or addresses your question. You need to understand it and you need to be able to have confidence that it is relevant. It goes to the three R space. It goes to everything. It's that understanding. And it is a it's a big shift to go from just clinical trial data, for example, to support an indication or medicines um, benefit risk to real world data. And I think that's probably going to be one of our biggest challenges in the short term. Um, and a lot of it's going to be driven by industry based confidential use cases with the agency. But I think that's going to be one of the key things that's going to help drive things forward is is that um, education sharing and, and expertise and um, it will it will start with conversations with the agency, and I mentioned that the need for that early interaction and engagement that we want to try and take a different approach, and we're seeing that in the three R space with the um, kind of open invitation in ITF to have those conversations if it's three R's related, um, and I think that's going to be have to be one of our sources moving forward for industry to really use this type of approaches. I mean, I gave you 
two or three very high level examples, but I'm sure across the industry, within companies, we're looking at data and digital in all sorts of ways across the organization, all the way through to ways we can use it in R&D to the way it translates through to our development. Um, but for us to actually use it in a regulatory context, it's, it, it needs that confidence that it's worth investing in it because it will deliver an indication of medicine. It will get something to the market faster, for example. So I think that's maybe a challenge back to the network <laughs> on how we do that. Yeah, thank you very much, Kat. And um, I think um, in that case, I am going to pass it to uh, Thomas online, please. Um. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, we can. Quiet. Great, thank you so much. Yes, uh, Kat already addressed some issues and I guess uh, it's all about awareness finally. <laughs> So awareness within the network, of course, but also, uh, of course, acceptance of new methodologies uh, that are in place or should be in place in the future. Uh, of course, I can share some of your thoughts, Kat. Of course, I also uh, have some different point of view in, uh, yeah, just regarding the acceptance by the assessors. I think in general, there's a certain will to change and uh, you even have to distinguish between um, different areas. So for instance, we separated our um, department into three different groups. First group is on authorization, second group is on post-marketing, third group is on yeah, services that are providing uh, additional help to uh, the other two uh, sections, uh, the other two groups. And in the third group, we also have right now a new section on um, big data. So we really address this issue and uh, Sandra Bertolat, I can see her right now, she's just part of this group and we really want to advance this in this direction. And uh, if we just look at the two other group, it is probably more difficult to involve uh, big data into authorization first, but it's more easy and probably also more reasonable to do it first in post-marketing issues like pharmacovigilance, like uh, AMR that has already been mentioned several times. And I think it's very beneficial to use big data, both for AMR, for pharmacovigilance, later also for clinical trials, as it's already done on the human uh, side, but um, yeah, also on environmental issues, which we are not in charge of. So we see these opportunities, but just to mention, we are not the regulators. So it's just, we are just one NCA out of many NCAs within the European network. Uh, on the other hand, we have the EMA and of course, uh, EMA and Evo, thank you so much, Evo, you just initiated uh, the initiative for the new veterinary uh, big data strategy. And uh, you were just looking for the coalition of the willing. And uh, of course, BBL was one of the willing. We have several others who are also willing to uh, introduce big data into their procedures. We have other agencies who still need to be convinced to be part of this. Uh, system and also part of the group and we're still trying to convince those guys and yes you're right we also have to convince some of the assessors because they're used to some procedures which have been harmonized and just to uh, well probably to use other methods to be included and in the daily work is something like a real challenge because uh, harmonized procedures has also have also been proven to be valid and to be reliable and we have to prove that our new methods that we are going to apply, the introduction of big data, for instance, in pharmacovigilance, uh, that these data are also reliable if we're going to prepare these data, not only using, of course, big data as a whole, but also introducing AI for the evaluation of these data. So yes, you're right, Kat, to a certain degree, but this is only our stage. So we also have a second one and these are the veterinarians and of course, we will hear from the veterinarians what their problems are. I can only tell that we already had some real challenges with the new vet legislation. And we introduced uh, some new data, of course, with new vet legislation and on the veterinarian side. We didn't only have, uh, well, uh, those who said, well, we have so much time, we can also spend a lot of time on data um, submission, uh, especially right now for the, um, uh, antibac uh, antibacterials uh, use data. So I think many challenges have been come up and this will be a new challenge. And first of all, we need to have something like awareness among not only regulators, but also veterinarians and all those others who are to be involved within this process. 
And I think probably on the industry side, it's easier to manage all this. Maybe not, I'm not sure, you got to tell. But uh, on our side, we are interested in doing this, but it's also seen as a great challenge, but we are willing to face this challenge. And this is why we were joining uh, the approach by EMA on the new bet uh, strategy for big data. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I think I'm uh, going to pass it straight to Jopke to give the third perspective on this panel um, from the veterinary healthcare professionals um, and uh, yeah, what you need essentially. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody is equally well acquainted with the FEE, so a very short word on the FEE. The Federation of European Veterinarians represents 45 national associations in 38 European countries. So altogether, we're representing some 300,000 vets uh, in a variety of jobs. Uh, FEE has, among others, different working groups, one of them being the Medicines Working Group. And I'm the chair of that group, uh, and that's also uh, the role in which I'm representing FEE today over here. Well, definitely one of the strategic priorities of FEE is embracing technology. So we see opportunities, uh, opportunities like uh, possibilities to have more monitoring of the market, for example, real-time monitoring of shortages uh, or identification of treatment alternatives. And we also see a lot of possibilities uh, to support innovation, uh, to use these new technologies, these big data tools to identify unmet needs, but also uh, to identify, for example, uh, new diagnostics to develop uh, or identify alternatives to antibiotics, but also to, for example, ease uh, the reporting of uh, pharmacovigilance and to receive feedback on that. And we also hope that it will support, for example, uh, the SPC harmonization and modernization, and perhaps also optimization of treatment schedules in practice. But we also see some barriers. Uh, a very important one is the time and resources to be allocated by veterinarians. So that's predominantly the administrative burden. Uh, but we also have question about what about data ownership, uh, accessibility to data, uh, actually things that also already have been mentioned on different levels. Uh, and we also worry about a lack of standardization of collected data, uh, also looking from the veterinary point of view, of course. Then it is, of course, very interesting how to overcome some of these issues. Uh, Thomas already raised the issue of awareness. Uh, and if you talk about the currently available systems and tools, for example, the Union Product Database, uh, we really encourage to improve these currently available systems because uh, it would be great if the veterinarians have more trust and more confidence in, this systems, in these systems. Uh, because it will not, but because that will also improve their interest in working with these type of systems, and it would be very useful, of course. Uh, and you can also think about things like, in the end, extending the UPD, for example, with a shortage database, uh, and that in the end all these data will be centralized, available, and actually quite connected to that, uh, it would be very interesting to know what the data needs from the veterinarians are. Because once you know their data needs, uh, you can also determine, okay, what data would, for example, be prioritized and how to analyze it, how to set the goals. Uh, and I think that's very important because these data are, of course, big, they're big data. And together with that also goes uh, the cleverly, in the end, cleverly 
connecting of all the existing tools, not only within the area of the VMPs, but also, for example, in the area of uh, animal health surveillance data, which will further improve the applicability in the field. Well, these are some. I can, I can add more, but perhaps it's wise to <laughs> further continue the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, th I think we, we got some, uh, some good uh, views there. Um, but uh, maybe then back to the back to the panel and whoever wants to take it first. Um, wh where should we start? Maybe if we if we can issue a call for action um, on any of the barriers that we identified and, and maybe the indications you already gave on how we could solve them. Um, wh who would you um, who would you ask to do what each of you? Um, <laughs> Um, uh, or is there a strong message we can give here from the from the forum, maybe in some direction um, that we should go in to to support this? Thomas, please start. Yeah, thank you so much. Probably addressing both issues. First of all, addressing what Jok was just stating. I think it's very important that uh, those who are involved need to know what their benefit is from using big data. So especially the veterinarians. So we have been uh, talking about this issue also in terms of our symposium on Monday and Tuesday on AMR. And this is also pretty much interlinked because as I mentioned, we are currently assessing, uh, we, we need to record the use data together with EMA and we're going to report it on a national level. And uh, we had some examples from different member states, how they going to address this issue. And I was very impressed, especially by the Irish approach where they were applying new uh, apps that are sent to the veterinarians just to record uh, the data. And uh, they also said, of course, just like our Spanish colleagues, and we also use this approach, we have to, uh, yeah, have if what we need, have, we have to do some kind of feedback to the veterinarians that they realize that they also have a benefit from all what uh, we are, with what we have to do in this case and what we are planning to do using any kind of data and what the data is used for by ourselves is the one thing. The second thing is what can the data be used on the veterinary side just as a feedback. So how can they improve their own um, yeah, daily work and just uh, using the results from the data that is submitted. They need to need some get some feedback on how they can probably proceed with these data. I know that EMA also has some uh, efforts in this direction especially on, on AMR. So this is something that is desperately needed and seeked, and it makes, of course, finally, it gives some kinds of acceptance by the veterinarians and by those who are involved, and also uh, yeah, encourages us to, to move even further. And uh, on the other side, of course, what we need to do, and this has already been mentioned, is some kind of education. Uh, Kat also mentions this, that we uh, what we need is to uh, yeah, of course, gain awareness and also to uh, show what is possible when using big data in practice. And uh, we have one tool at uh, the EU level, at the uh, um, at the level of the member states and at the level of EMA, that's the NTC training program. And we also discussed it within the NTC uh, steering group that what we need right now is also to have some education on certain issues. We identified within a survey that uh, at the highest priority AMR has been assigned to, number one, but uh, big data has not yet been recognized really, but we also have to uh, yeah, bring to the attendance that, uh, of those uh, who are in charge that big data is just one tool to approach all the other issues that are of interest. So what we need is to have some kind of training tools, teaching tools that are going to be introduced into, into the NTC training program, just to uh, bring the, uh, yeah, the potentials of big data to the assessor's awareness that they can finally be confirmed that using big data is something that is, makes really a benefit for everyone and also for the assessors and their daily work. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, 
it's not an easy question to answer, but I'll maybe just say one of, I guess, industry's main short term priorities is to have the UPD complete, functioning and correct. <laughs> Sorry, um, I thought I'd just give a little bit of plug for that, because, I mean, I think in terms of short term goals, you know, that is, is critical for us to be really able to then to take the next step in terms of looking at how we can use that data and, um, you know, what value will, will bring for veterinarians, for the agency um, and, and industry's ability to be able to provide the information we're required to in an efficient and as low administrative way as possible. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, one of the short our short term goals is to reduce the admin burden consistent with the new regulation. And right now we're a long way from where we need to be. So in terms of short term focus, if we think about data and that, I mean, I think the the UPD is an important one. Um, and, and then the next step with that is, is I guess, is will then be the the user interface for it for access, public access to veterinarians. And then to, the, to some extent, then the, the level of training or education around what data are available and what they mean, because one of the things I think we do have to be cautious of in the context of big data is the technology, particularly with AI and data mining is accelerating really fast. And you're seeing that more from academia, et cetera. We, we just have to be careful of um, that poten the, the potential there for it to create a lot of noise. Um, without fully understanding what it means. And I think that's something we'll all need to be aware of as this accelerates very quickly, particularly in the the environmental and the pharmacovigilance space and you know what it all means that there's a, a need for training and education across the board. But I guess from an industry side of things, short term, the thing we really need is, is that the UPD to be functioning efficiently so that we can realize some of the benefits of that hope in reduced admin burden and better access and availability to data. I think everything with the innovation side of things, um, beyond what we've already talked about in terms of that sort of education and help, I, I think that will come. Um, you know, as Thomas says, that you know, the many agencies are very open to it and I think industry will will slowly move that forward as we start to explore it and use it further. And and what's happening on human health is a great place to start. And I think that would maybe be the other thing just for the veterinary side is to engage with what's happening in human health to learn from that and to understand how we can do that both from an industry point of view and from an assessor point of view because obviously the human health they're they're much more familiar with it and using it so i think there's a lot of room for um sharing experience and, and training there as another option outside of the veterinary sphere uh indeed and thank you very much kat um uh, in how far the UPD is big data in itself <laughs> uh, for us, certainly. Um, it is a, a big topic, um, as you know, and I, I feel like, um, yeah, wh what you say on, on getting it uh, complete, functional and correct uh, is certainly a priority uh, on the agency side as well. And I know the, the member states are working very hard on that too. Um, because I think the the... The message there is it, it all it's all connected, right? Um, and, it, and it goes down to uh, the information veterinarians are looking for, uh, for me at least, um, uh, because we are, for example, recording availability. Um, so the status marketed, not marketed, so you know whether a product is actually available somewhere or not, which is information that the veterinarians are interested in. Yeah. Um, and that only works if obviously the, the products and the packages are correctly in the UPD and then you can update uh, whether they are actually marketed or not, uh, which then uh, follows on in so many ways, you know, across uh, different regulatory procedures. Um, and that's where, you know, in combination with other systems, I see also a potential for um, uh, later on maybe shortages tracking that isn't part of uh, you know there's no legal base at the moment for that um, but we can we can see where that takes us so um, definitely um, interesting things I also got the message that education is um, is a topic um, both to build capacity in the in the network uh, to to um, actually yeah with the assessors to um, help with uh, information like that. And there we do what you what you suggest, Kat. Uh, so at the moment, I think we are drawing a lot of inspiration from what is happening on the human side. And we saw the update there from, from Jesper. They are uh, going at warp speed, really. Um, 
we don't have the, again, capacity to actually follow in that speed, but I think we can carefully in fora like this um, pick and choose what we want to um, pursue on the veterinary side. So what is likely to give us the most benefits, what is most likely to um, further what we would like to do. Um, so um, I think I'll uh, just hand over to Jopke in case you want to um, add anything as well. Yeah, thank you. Now we are of course very happy regarding all the developments uh, and, and, and have foreseen improvements regarding, for example, the UPD. Uh, and as already mentioned for us, it's very important really to encourage and, and to emphasize the collaboration and uh, not only between the different parties, but also between the different tools and technologies. Uh, and from the veterinarian point of view, really to kind of get insight, more insight into the needs of these vets, because in a way it's a classical change management to say, because we're talking to them about uh, how things work and whether they are applicable in practice, user-friendly, and actually reduce the administrative burden, which we, I think, all all like. Uh, that also raises awareness. I think that talking about an, an issue or a tool is already the first step in awareness. And in the end, that will result in a desire among the vets to really actually use these tools to a, a further extent and also to become positive and have ideas on, as already kind of pointed to already, uh, certain extensions of the systems so that there will be in the end more or less one portal and kind of thinking one line of input data centralized but different outputs focused on the groups, the target groups you are focusing at. Well, that that was the thing I really liked to add. Thank you, Jana. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we are slowly coming to the end of the session, but we had a question in the chat um, about the sandbox. Let me just find it. So uh, there was a question, could it be possible or useful to work in those topics of big data, AI, machine learning, real world data, and so on, uh, to, to work with sandboxes in high commerce? Um, and I think I'm going to pass that uh, question to Ivo. Well, thank you very much. Um, it, I, it, the answer to that, the simple answer to that is yes, of course, that would be you know uh, uh, useful to do that, and it's possible. And in fact, uh, regulatory sandboxes are in the new pharma uh, proposal uh, for the human side. Uh, basically, a regulatory sandbox is a, a tool where you can test novel, innovative approaches and see how they work in practice, and and you can do that in a sort of real life environment. Which, which makes it very realistic and, and shows you what can be the benefits and what can be the downsides of these uh, systems. Uh, obviously, uh, the regulatory sandbox, as I said, is a testing environment, is a testing tool. What you would need uh, also is to provide the correct regulatory framework uh, for using artificial intelligence and using data that are not in the original dossier uh, of, a, of a product, and, and without that proper regulatory framework, uh, you, you could be open to litigation if you come to decisions that are not necessarily based on the information that is in uh, the dossier that's provided in the dossier, but you use information outside of the dossier. Now, we've always been doing that. If we have information that gives us uh, doubts about uh, either efficacy or safety of certain uh, products that are being presented to us. We should take that into account. So I think the, 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 the framework allows it. And, and, and Kat, uh, in, ter in relation to innovation, you already said, you know, there's nothing that is blocking the, the use of, you know, big data uh, also in the dossier submission. So it would be weird if we would uh, have blockades on, on the other side there. But it's certainly areas that we need to look at. So. For me, uh, regulatory sandboxes are a really great tool to investigate the opportunities. And then eventually you would roll it into the more formal regulatory framework. Uh, once you have that toolbox developed, you could use it there. Over to you. 
Yeah, thank you very much, um, Ivo. Okay, and I think we are uh, more or less on time. Uh, was there another question? No? Just comments. Okay, um, and, and thank you very much uh, for the support in the chat as well um, to the topics we discussed here. Um, I think I pass it straight back to you, Ivo, for um, closing, if you're ready. More or less. I'm, I'm more. I'm more or less ready for closing. If there's no more, no more questions. No, I think. I think overall, uh, I would like to uh, uh, start by thanking uh, all of you very much for your engagement in this area and for the very active discussion. Of course, the presenters uh, to this meeting and the and the panelists uh, for their direct contribution and direct input in in this. I think overall, since you, since the last event and, and since we started these meetings, awareness on big data has increased and, and the coalition of willing that uh, also Thomas referred to uh, has been established, but we need to further expand that uh, coalition of the willing and, and uh, increase the acceptance of the use of big data and alternative data in the regulatory uh, framework. Uh, I heard uh, uh, Kat uh, say today in her presentation that uh, that she's made, she's been on a journey over the past two years, as a as a regulator coming from industry, and that uh, that 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 I think that that's a nice example uh, of the journey that we're all in and how we how we can develop this and that we make a step each each and every year, uh, and this is also the way that we designed our big data strategy in uh, and may, maybe it's still too ambitious, but in 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 setting you know. Uh, low target level first, and then gradually building it up. I think the, the 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 theme from the publication that we had the first publication on veterinary big data, where we had our uh, where we presented our big data strategy, was uh, from collection to connection uh, of data. And uh, uh, what I've learned today was also that uh, if you really want to look at it as big data, you need to look at those different data sources and and be able to integrate uh, those uh, those data sets and ask the right questions. So uh, uh, probe that data sets and make sure that you do get the answers uh, that you are looking for. Uh, and that will always be uh, the, the challenge here because whatever we do, we always want it to be science-based decisions that we take here uh, as a regulatory framework. Now, in uh, I think with today's event, we also uh, continue to build up collaboration, and we appreciate uh, the, the, these active discussions. We've we've heard uh, different stakeholders' perspectives: veterinarian side, the NCA side, industry side. We've invited uh, uh, international partners uh, on this. With with uh, and I thank you, Jos, for presenting. You know how we are working with uh, other collaborators to uh, to bring uh, to bring more. Than. So session one. We had updates on the big data activities in the European regulatory network, which is accelerating, I think, third, certainly to a high speed in the human domain. And we need to be careful to stay proportionate when we're choosing what initiatives can inspire the veterinary domain, because not everything that they do on the human domain is what we necessarily need or what we would like to invest in. There's, a lot, there's different things ongoing. We should recognize those differences. Um, we also noted that the convergence of the new legislation, the strategy on big data for VET, and the availability of research budget all support a driver to keep the momentum in, in defining direction of travel and concrete actions for the veterinary domain. But I'm happy to see that there's also on the side of the NCA's activities that, that try to establish, you know, really VET, VET big data hubs and with the industry as well. Uh, I think that is essential. And, and this is also why it's essential that we continue this, this dialogue amongst ourselves. Session two, we heard applications of data as examples guided by practical use cases. And, and I'm sure we will we'll draw inspiration uh, from those. And, and in fact, those practical use cases, uh, I, I would say, are also the ones that we defined very early on. Uh, environmental risk assessment, uh, AMR, pharmacovigilance, uh, I think on top of that, innovation, you know, uh, it can support innovation, three R's. So the, the, the use cases are expanding. Uh, all I can say there is let's let's keep an eye on that. We're not trying to do too much in, in, in one go. 
but it's it, it is certainly good to see that we are bringing some substance to the use cases that we already defined uh, two years ago, two three years ago. I think it's it, it is uh, it shows that it was developed with a uh, with a vision in mind and and uh, also with an eye on the feasibility of using big data for these for these use cases. Um, Interventions from other EU and international organizations showed how the collection, integration, analysis, and communication could support animal health and welfare and public health and environmental uh, uh, health. A session three uh, that we just closed provided a platform to freely discuss some areas for further reflection and some challenges to overcome. Data ownership, infrastructure, interoperability, expertise within the network, and on that uh, I would like to draw your attention to the curriculum on big data that's being developed, that's being rolled out, uh, both for human and veterinary, uh, through the EU NTC the network. It will be announced. So for those of you that have access to that EU NTC training, please keep an eye on it, uh, because that will allow you to learn more about big data and uh, everything connected to that. Um, and... Uh, and, and we, the, the data landscape in animal health is increasing fast. I think it's also something we should realize, and we need to ensure that our regulatory decision-making model adapts and is prepared to overcome the challenges ahead. So by the time you also, and you, I would like to urge you to speed up a bit because by the time you publish, it's already you know a hopelessly outdated report, very likely. Uh, but also, uh, artificial intelligence is 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 one of those elements, and I think. Uh, the, the, the presentation of Swiss Medic showed very elegantly how that can be used based on already existing publicly available uh, uh, sources, how you can then really, uh, uh, you know, I would say amplify the possibilities that those sources already provide by using artificial intelligence approaches. And I thought that was a really inspiring, and it's a pity that the colleague is not longer here, but I think there's a really inspiring uh, presentation showing us the possibilities. Uh, we're still big data strategy 1.0. He's already 4.0. So, so maybe we should set our ambitions uh, a bit higher in that, uh, that respect. I think we, we need to continue to embrace the opportunities for data-driven, evidence-based, robust decision-making and that will indeed underpin innovation uh, for development authorization and all market safety uh, for the wider benefit of, of animal and public health, I think that 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 is that is there. Uh, but at the same time, we should not disrupt a, a functional regulatory model, which is delivering robust and proven and secure decision making. And and equally, we must not be afraid of change, uh, which, if managed and implemented appropriately, will ensure that the EU regulatory system is ready for those challenges of the future. Uh, I couldn't help but notice that the UPD was mentioned a few times. Now, the, the, the UPD, as you, as you all know, um, I, I'm, I'm still enormously proud of what we have delivered until now. And uh, uh, the, the UPD uh, will, in shorter or longer term, also deliver on all the promises it holds. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's also uh, something where we need to come together. It is, for me, first and foremost important that the UPD is a robust system. A robust system that people can trust and that uh, they can uh, uh, put the data in and, and can retrieve the data from, and that will deliver also functionality for veterinarians. But robustness is one of the, uh, uh, the key features that we, we're looking for. Robustness, user friendliness is also something that we are investing in. Uh, it all comes with data quality, because if we don't have the good quality data in there, uh, uh, we, we, will, uh, we, will, we will not look at, uh, we, it, it will not work. If we have established all that, only then we could, we could look at uh, increasing functionality and seeing how we can, I mean, we can use the data from the, the, the UPD for big data approaches. But I don't think we should try to build that functionality for big data analysis into the UPD, because once we start doing that, it will uh, very likely impact on the uh, performance 
and uh, we have a huge risk that we will increase uh, we will introduce bugs there and it will lead to a lower functionality. So that's just a warning, but I, I do understand the UPD is one of those uh, those things. Um, so um, I I would like to really come to the closure of the, of, of the meeting. Um, again, uh, uh, let, me, let me come with a quote first, uh, a quote that I have here in front of me. Uh, our future is a race between the growing power of our technology and the wisdom with which we use it. So let's make sure the wisdom wins. I think that's one of the, so whatever we do, uh, we, 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 will, we will look into that. Um, and uh, with this, I would like to close this meeting by thanking all the speakers and the panelists for the fantastic contributions, those who have followed the events and uh, in room and online. And of course, I would like to say a big thank you to uh, the, the lovely team that has been supporting this, uh, this meeting um, uh, for another fantastic and well-organized big data stakeholder forum. And with that, meeting goes. Thank you very much.